So, um, welcome everybody to uh, the second acting event. Um, we'll be having lectures today on digital interaction and digital learning across the lifespan. We've got a great program ahead of us. Um, I'm Eve Hogerforst. I'm a professor of biological uh, psychology uh, at Loughborough University, and I co-chair the Applied Cognition Technology and Interaction Group with Dr. Sal Albert, who's in social sciences. Um, we're here in the room currently with about, well, what would it be, 12 people, and then there is everybody online. We're really grateful uh, for you for joining us. Um, we've got a slight change to the program, which is um, Tracy Richards from Mencap has very kindly last minute um, told us she would introduce Mencap and the work that they are doing. So we'll start with that. And then we'll go on to the first keynote. Um, and then we'll have a couple of shorter talks followed by the second keynote and a sand pit. Now, importantly for the sand pit, hopefully uh, you would have had a form which uh, Sal send around. Yes. And uh, this form um, is really important for the sand pit. So, while you're listening to the talks, you often get these ideas and you're thinking, oh, you know, yes, I can do this. I can, I can work with these people or that links on to what I've done before, or what I've done previously. So it'd be fantastic if you would make these notes on the form for the sandpit. So in the sandpit, we have... Um, uh, we have we ask for your name, your contact, uh, your research area of interest or your expertise. So things you've been working with before, like, for instance, cognition or qualitative research or what have you. Uh, which particular talk inspired ideas? You know, there might have been uh, Alison might have said something, Professor Oral or Lucy Bichon is here. You know, anything that's that that inspired you. And then. Um, if you could could make notes here for the sandpit. So this is, I have an idea about who could benefit. For instance, the people from Mancap might be thinking, oh yes, this could really work. You know, this idea I have could really benefit people with learning disability, people with dementia, children, all the people in general. Um, and, and what would benefit a particular group of people? So what is a particular need? So independent living. How can we facilitate that with digital, um, with digital um, uh, media? So what people, projects or organizations could be involved? So if you're working at a hospital, working in a care home, would, would, would you be able to involve us with these groups of people? Uh, what sort of methodologies do you use? And it, it doesn't have to be a long story, but you might be thinking, oh yes, I could I could really apply. I've, I've built this app and that would really work. Uh, Praise might have come up with a fantastic app. You, you should be able to use that. You know, maybe we can collaborate. Uh, funding opportunities. Now we're putting this together. And the reason we're doing these three talks now so we had an introduction talk in july but now we've got three talks the first one being digital learning across the lifespan so in children and in older people with or without dementia and then the second one is about digital interactions and sensory deficits and we'll be focusing on changes in visual perception on hearing loss in cognition for instance as well so how do cognitive issues affect uh, interaction with with digital media and how can you mitigate that and then the third one so that's in january and then the the third one the last one is on digital environments design um apps to mitigate uh, behavioral and psychiatric symptoms associated with dementia or in general challenging behaviors. So what do we know about person-centered therapy? Has that been appified? Can we do anything with that? So that's the third one and that'll be in March. Um, now, 
Sal is saying something about your story that something has amusingly gone wrong. Oh, it's kind of confusing. So I'm, Sorry, to, if I'm, just so I'm a menopause that. woman and trying to dual task is really difficult. So I'm occasionally getting messages sort of go like, and I, so I can't dual task and I have to go back on track. My track was, okay, I was in the third meeting. Um, and so the idea is ultimately that together we come up with ideas. And this is also in particular focused on junior researchers, not just uh, senior researchers who've got apps, who've got this, that and the other, although we really want to work with you as well, but also really working with PhDs, with people who have brilliant, young, fresh ideas. OK, so don't don't be shy in coming forward with this if you think. Ooh, you know, this might work. I've read about this. Please, you know, share your ideas with us. It doesn't have to be structured, but if you use a structure, it's slightly easier to work with us in the sand pits. So um, any ideas you've got, any methods you've got, any particular groups you've got, uh, great. Um, we're thinking about different funding streams um, because ultimately these meetings should um combine two funding proposals at least one probably two we've got ideas but we're not going to tell you about that yet because we want you to come up with ideas so the talks we've got are great because they'll be feeding into these ideas and um yeah that's all i wanted to say about it so do you want to add um something to this just to say welcome everybody thank you so much for joining us and uh thank you to everybody joining us on uh, zoom today i'll do my best to administrate as you've seen we have some technical issues which is that everybody is being named saul albert in the uh, in the zoom <laughs> meeting which is wonderful for me but if you wouldn't mind renaming yourselves thank you so much and i'm really looking forward to the day yeah thank you i don't know how that happened it's it's interesting it's one of these mysteries isn't it so um okay we'll start we've got a surprise guest uh we're very lucky uh tracy richards from mencap said uh, we, we were talking about potential collaborations and tracy um has kindly um suggested we've got 20 minutes in total and i've only used up seven so tracy is going to use the rest of the time to talk about her uh to introduce herself uh, she'll hopefully be part of this group and uh, the work that she does with MENCAP. So I'll be handing over to Tracy. Um, let me see. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to try to share the screen. Here we go. Share. There we go. Can you see it? Can you see Tracy's? Okay, oops. Hi. Yours. Yours. Well, Thank you everybody for um, being here and listening to me. Probably only be about 10 minutes. I won't take up too much of your time. So for those of you that don't know who Mencap are, we are a national UK based charity supporting people with learning disabilities. Yes. And we provide um, campaigning and activism to, to fight for the rights and the needs of people with learning disability. But we also provide social care support for people either in their own homes or um, in the community. And that's probably the largest part of our organization. Um, my role is assistive technology lead for MENCAP, and that looks at all the technology that for people with a learning disability, what they might use and what our staff might use to support them to become as independent as possible and add to their quality of life. Um, on the screen, you can see um, we've got today's going to be awesome, our big plan. Our big plan is a new strategy to move our organisation into a more modern way of working, a more holocratic organisation. We move in hierarchy and looking at a more... Um, self-empowered teams model and as part of that we want to be able to introduce technology as part and parcel of the way we deliver support across the organization um, to do that we've um, got a working group a strategic working group who are looking at um, ways we might do that um, effectively it's a new way of working to many many people that we work with we support about eight and a half thousand people um, and there's a lot of traditional ways of supporting people going on and we want to see how we can embed that technology for the benefit of the people with a learning disability so we set up some working groups as part of a, a technology strategy we call it technology for life because it should be technology that helps them live the life the way that they want to and that's part of our overall big plan 
So looking at the, the next screen, do I just click that one? Yeah, so our vision is to make the UK the best place in the world for people with learned disabilities to live happy, healthy lives. And to do that, we realise that we live in a technological world and we need to help people live in that world and not rely on um, support, physical support, as much as they currently do, and perhaps use technology as we might to enhance our life and make things easier for us, and the same could apply for them. And if we don't, they face further inequity of needing yet somebody else to help them do something that we all take for granted to do on it by ourselves. So we started using um, agile methodology to do this as part of a whole organizational way of working. But within the, the group we worked on, we looked at um, going through sort of an understand phase and empathize and define where and how we might embed um, assistive technology within the processes that we currently use. And to do that, we use what we call design um, thinking as part of a, a suite of, material, of resources you can use with Agile. And part of that was um, looking at a design at a, an empathy map. And that looked at a process and it broke it down into what was a persona. So we chose some personas, we chose five personas. What would that person be thinking, doing and feeling during that process? And the five personas that we chose were People with a learning disability, we had two people, one who was fairly um, young, aged in their early 20s, new to um, being provided with care and support in the community, and, a, and a, another persona of a gentleman who was that bit older and has been through the care system, but maybe supported by MENCAP for the first time. And we looked at two processes. One was our needs assessment and support planning, how we establish what that person needs and wants and how we're going to support them to achieve that. And the other process was a review process that we have at least once a year to review how things have gone and how things might go in the future and what they'd like to achieve. And we felt that they were the two key points um, within a person's journey with us where we would be specifically talking about assistive technology. That would be the most likely time. That's not to exclude any of the other times. It's just that they would be the most key moments that we would need to address. So we conducted um, some empathy maps we looked at what people think of that process what they feel and what they're doing during that process and from that we came up with some um, feedback so what we discovered um, in the initial support planning process was that the initial um, reactions for a person who was younger the introduction was really important but the person that was slightly older with a learning disability that they um, it was more about talk, getting to know them a bit more and getting to understand what changes have occurred since they last had a review with their local authority. The next persona was a family member and both those moments mattered for the family member. And then I'll, I'll skip over support worker and go to the social worker. And again, the first impression really counted. So if we were to put technology in place, we'd have to be very sure of ourselves what we were saying and what we were doing at that point. But the interesting thing was that um, for the family member, talking to everybody in their environment was important. So we don't want to be um, explaining and introducing things at that moment in time necessarily. We want them to feel comfortable in the environment. But for our staff, for the workforce, agreeing the support and putting together a support plan was the key moments for them, the key moments that mattered in that journey. And the little, um, the dark squares indicate the moments that mattered that were chosen as part of that group work with six services and around about 22 people in total who inputted what they thought their feelings would be. And then we looked at the review process. So the person's already with us and we're viewing what's happened over the past year. We're looking at how they're feeling now, what they would like to get out the year ahead and what sort of plans and goals and ambitions and wishes that they would have. And it's, it's kind of interesting that um, yet again, the same pattern appears is that the, 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 the bit where it matters for the staff was around deciding what that process looked like and how to break that down into milestones. And that was a key moment for staff. And when we looked about the key moments, we looked at what their feelings were and overall where those key moments are, where the moments that matter, the overall um, feeling was anxiety. There was an anxious feeling, some excitement, some happiness and nervousness, but anxiety was quite high. And then we spoke about why it matters. 
So we felt that technology would most likely to be introduced during these stages. And understanding those moments that matter will help inform where support and resources um, should be for each of those people to minimize that resistance to um, adopting something new or a new way of working. At the end of the day, it's a change in the way people are being supported. So it needs managing as if it's a change process. And the feelings, how they directly inform the intention areas when we're looking at how, using technology to support somebody. And from the feedback we got, the overarching aspects, um, barriers to adoption from the dialogue that, was, that, that we had was money, where we're going to, how we're going to fund it now to buy something and how we're going to fund it in the future, if it's a subscription model or it needs updating regularly, fear of the unknown, just not knowing what you don't know is kind of a little bit scary, particularly for somebody with a learning disability. What resources would they have? What coaching would they have? Um, there was a high significance in all the conversations about workforce development and the importance of bringing the circle of support that surround a person along the journey with us rather than working against them. So the whole, the whole feeling was that everybody needs to be invested in making it work. It can't just be a, a piece of technology that you put in front of somebody because it fits a need. It's more about how they adopt that technology and the support and the affirmation that the whole circle of support can give them. And then we looked at, I asked some questions about what technology would services like? This is to our six service teams. What benefits would you identify by using technology? What barriers would you come against? How would you break down those barriers? What tools and resources would you need and where would you find them? And the interesting thing about that journey is that they were very good at saying what sort of technology they think might be helpful. And we're looking at everyday technology at this point in time. So things like your Alexas and smartwatches, mobile phones, things you and I would use every day and not really think about. They were very clear about the benefits they think they could exert from them. And but they weren't so clear about how to break down those barriers. This is where the, the responses weren't quite so um, voluminous or there was a lot of discussion about what wouldn't work. And it often got down to the granular of what wouldn't work for a particular person rather than a group. And then tools and resources um, you might be needed and where to find them was also an area. And the bits in red have been highlighted because they all relate to training of staff or coaching of staff or coaching of people around it. And that was the predominant thing that came out of this process is that actually we need to get the basis, we need to get the, the foundation right. It's so not very not so good just to put a piece of technology in and hope it will work. It's about making sure that when you put any piece of technology into a service, that they have the skills, understanding and the knowledge necessary to embrace that technology, encourage the person with a learning disability through that change process effectively to make that technology work for them and to make it stick, to maintain it. So the next steps we spoke about with the staff was to work again with the group in January of next year. It's very busy in learning disability world around about Christmas, lots of things are going on. Um, working with the Include Me group. The Include Me group is a group of people with a learning disability that we work with who give their insight and their views to co-create this rather than doing two, we're doing together with, and using those ins insights to collaborate with yourselves at Loughborough and establish research around responses from that working group to perhaps look at some funding, to provide some non-partial evaluation from yourselves hopefully and uh, working with other charities and findings and resources so we can share um, what we do well and what didn't work so well so we can inform each other and combine that in the new year so in continuing the work in the new year we're looking at reviewing in more detail the feedback from the questionnaires there's still a few more to come in and um, the monthly feedback to the group is what we're going to provide them feedback to yourselves about what we're doing so we can collaborate and share what our findings are with yourself feedback to our include me group and to arrange some sessions in January. And that's me. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Hang on, Tracy. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you. Maybe some questions for Tracy quickly. Anybody have any questions? And they stomp them into or, silence. Yeah, well, it might have just been crystal clear. <laughs> so when you said support for the staff, yes, because what I got back was that 
the people with learning disability were asking, was it the staff I was asking about? It these? was the group, so it was the staff that were talking about what they think would work. Right. Um, but they didn't all, the digital literacy um, is quite low. It's not an mm -hmm. area, it's not- in, um, in the staff. Yeah, it's not a sector that's used digital no. technology in mm -hmm. abundance. So it's, it's fairly new to mm -hmm. them. So there is a, a, a way to go to help them feel comfortable in doing that. And if they are in, uncomfortable in using technology, that will um, radiate back onto the people they're of course. trying to support. Of course. So um, the finding was that actually we need to make sure that the group of people, the staff that we have, yep. and also their support circle are really understanding what we're doing, why we're yep. doing it, how it's going to work, and how it can benefit the person with the learning yep. disability to have that sort of bedrock before mm -hmm. we introduce the technology itself. So what does the technology actually do? depends on what they choose. Ah, okay. So it's, it's down to their personal choice. So it could mm -hmm. be an Alexa for reminders. Right, right, okay. It, it could be um, a GPS watch so that they can learn to travel independently yeah. in the community. It could just be using Zoom. Yeah. And to keep in touch with their relatives and friends, or it could be, it could be a number of things, whatever they want it to be. Um, it's about so finding it's existing technology, existing technology. And, and have you done sort of like a scoping exercise to think, is this useful for people beforehand? You've collected this on a... On no, a... this is about trying, this is about um, agile thinking, so design yeah. and thinking, so then um, prototyping, feeding back, prototyping, feeding back till we come up with something. But because everyone's an individual, there might be a whole plethora of different things, okay. but it's more about the process and how we make sure staff are comfortable with whatever's mm -hmm, thrown mm -hmm. at them, as opposed yeah. to, um, it's not about the technology, it's about what people want as an outcome and what technology sure. will help them meet the outcome yeah. that they choose. So are you making schemas? I can see Rosie there. Rosie's got a question. Ooh, that's horrible. Wow, <laughs> Rosie is, we're, we're keeping Rosie here in a dungeon, so that's why she's sort of standing a bit. Uh, but, ooh, <laughs> Rosie, do you want to come here, maybe? <laughs> see, this is how working in a group works really well with technology. <laughs> It's literally a really small question, yeah. and you might have already said it. Is um, particular age groups that you work with? No, so adults with learning disability, anybody over the age of 18. And have you found maybe people like the younger population might be better with yeah. these than... So people with a learning older. disability who are younger, mm. they've had it, their digital natives, just like anybody else is younger, so their understanding is better. Yeah. And the same for staff in general, but there are obviously exceptions across the board but the industry itself the sector doesn't really hasn't historically used technology in the way we're thinking of currently mm. so it's all very new regardless of your age yeah in many ways <clears throat> right <laughs> oh, sorry we're, we're not very good at, if, at keeping the camera involved are we no if yes. we have a question from tom in the chat hi tom how how are you <laughs> um hi eva um uh, uh um can't see anybody. Um, oh, that's right. It's, that's, that's better. Shall I, um, shall I, oh, we're sharing the screen. Sorry. Um, stop sharing the screen so you can hopefully okay. see us. Right. So um, I'm, I'm not a, a learning disability expert at all. I'm um, an old age psychiatrist and my interests are with people with dementia. But where, where we've looked at kind of how you get things done, um, particularly in, in care homes, um, we, we find that often the, the, the key thing is about um really management support or staff feeling that they have a um they have permission to to provide um good care or permission to do the right thing um so i'd imagine that in terms of getting anything done or bringing about any change then um sort of management support whatever we mean by management um is it, and this permission thing is really important so did you find that tracy or was it not kind of it wasn't quite that sort of project maybe um well it's not a project yet we're still developing it but we okay. did do a project with Bowdoin phone a while ago and yes it does need leadership that's one thing not necessarily management but certainly leadership and um I think that most staff are just a bit wary they don't know what they don't know and if they don't know how to use the technology themselves, it's very hard to teach somebody mm. else to use it. And it's also very difficult to see how you can adapt it for use for somebody with a learning disability. You need a, a degree of creativity. And that's what we're trying to work out how we do that right now. Thanks. 
Thank you. That, that's a great question. I think um, what we're looking at here is, of course, you know, now we've been with quite a big group struggling with the technology, right? So everybody's called Sol Albert and then we sort of <laughs> collectively come up with a way of solving this. But I think the problem is if you're on one to one and you are like, I wouldn't have a clue how to work with Alexa, but partly because Alexa just won't understand, will just refuse to understand what I ask it. And it's probably because I'm Dutch, but I can imagine if you're, if there are perhaps language difficulties sure. in learning disability, yes. that Alexa will do the same as it, as it does to me and goes, I don't know who your mom is, Eve. And it's like, <laughs> what? But I was asking to play simple minds, you know, so it, it, it's a little bit like that. Yeah. I just want to mention about the um, dementia aspect. Um, people with a learning disability, particularly those with Down syndrome, are also prone to early onset dementia. Mm. Um, so there is a link between the two. And with, the, with an older client group, you'll tend to looking at maintaining their functionality. But with a younger age group, you're looking at trying to develop skills in order to increase their um, independence. So it's a kind of a different way of looking mm. at it. So mm -hmm. the same technology, but used for different ways. So you're often teaching them or coaching them to learn new skills, mm -hmm. not and sometimes keeping the skills they've already got, but certainly trying to develop their skills so they can live a quality life. That's brilliant. We, we did a lot of work with learning disability and dementia detection uh, across cultures uh, in the past. So we've got some good software. And one of the things we've been thinking about is picking up how people sort of progress in their journey and, and yeah. whether we can pick up, whether people need more support perhaps in how they engage with the apps yeah. so this is something that we've been looking at uh, and perhaps as a focal point also in, and that's in why the, workforce in development is important because if they haven't got the skills to enable that to happen then it breaks down and the that's piece right. of equipment sat in the cupboard that's gathering right. dust somewhere for a long yeah. time yeah. yeah and then it's finding yeah. out how to support people and and having a systems feedback correct tell you that people yeah. aren't actually engaging and that it has been gathering us yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you. um okay uh, so yes just one more one more uh, comment in the chat from uh stuart stuart i don't know if you'd like to unmute and and make that comment but or i could read it out yeah uh yeah sure um can you see me i can't see myself for once um yeah so uh Basically, uh, sorry, I'm just <laughs> fixing my camera. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of research in HCI, the human computer interaction field I work around participatory design, as in kind of embedding users, end users into design processes um, um, in, a, in, a, in a very sort of um, deep way, um, almost like them leading design. Also, there's a load of stuff on sort of prototyping, um, again, sort of thinking about some of the things you're talking about with certain kinds of technologies that you might want to kind of test prototype versions of with people um, and so on. And I was wondering um, also, and again, some more of a comment, I suspect there's, again, I'm not familiar with it enough, but I suspect there's special methods people are using for specific things like learning disability to adapt and um, processes like participatory design um to those sorts of um uh, groups of people um because of the sort of needs they might have and yeah it's more of a comment to say there's it's interesting to hear about what you're doing and that there's this kind of world of potentially interesting world of research on on that sort of stuff that connects with it yeah. There's not so much work being done with learning disabilities, so the there is a gap in, re, in the research area there, specific, with technology that is. So yes, there is a gap. We did do a, a Vodafone project to do designing app, and we did use co-creative techniques there. And yeah. um, what we found is exactly what we found of this one is that actually it's the staff and the people that's not just the staff, but everybody that has a vested interest in supporting that person in one, any way, shape or form has a very strong um, impact on whether they adopt any technology at all. So, and as a basis of that, we, where it worked well with Vodafone is where they use person-centered active support um, methodology, which helped break things down to small steps regularly and often, and that seemed to work. So I suppose part of what we'd be doing would be see whether that is um, a good method to introduce this kind of technology to the majority 
of people because everyone's different so what might work for one may not work for another person yeah it's that personalization yeah. isn't it mm. thank you so much great questions i hope we can sort of work out some of this in the sand pits as well maybe further on um i would like to oh for those of you here did you want to ask a question oh you're just Sorry. doing your hair okay uh for those of you who are here we have lunch not for you those of you who are online obviously but we have lunch please go and and grab a bite uh to eat uh if you want lucy and and, and you as well they're over there it's all vegan and 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 all sorts so um let's uh, proceed with the program so we'll be we're very honored to have first keynote from dr allison khan i've known allison for I don't know, 20 years or more, and we met at Oxford, and Alison is still at Oxford and also works for Stanford University. She is um, working there on digital systems um, with um, uh, a new company working with their digital archives. Alison has been very involved in digital learning across the lifespan. We've done several projects together as well and um, what we hope is that her experience with children will very much feed into working with groups who are perhaps at different levels of information processing how to capture and how to transmit information uh, to people Alison's background is an anthropology and digital anthropology she's got her own company as well makes wonderful movies for which she's won many prizes and we're very lucky because Alison is also a visiting fellow at Loughborough University uh, to further these collaborations, which we hope to establish during this year. Um, Alison, um, let's see, Felicity, can we can we just share the uh, talk for Alison? Or Alison, you are a presenter now, I think, aren't you? So if you would like to share your um, your screen with us. It's really okay. sunny there in Oxford this year, actually. Can, can you hear me well? Am I yeah, loud and clear? Yep. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Eve. And um, it's an absolute honour to be with um, such esteemed uh, fellow researchers and uh, people working directly um, on the coalface with, with everybody who needs some help um, in some way. Now, I'm a visual anthropologist, so, just, so it's quite interesting. Um, so I'm a trained visual anthropologist, but visual anthropology has moved into digital anthropology, as we all have, because um, it's our business to know how people live. And um, so the, one of the, I suppose, the forte of a visual anthropologist is that we look beyond the text. Um, we're really interested in the corporeal um, presentation of culture, of people, um, what they do and how they surround themselves in their daily lives. And it's from looking beyond the text um, at the films people produce, the photographs and uh, art and uh, all sorts of artifacts um, in their in their societies that um, we we try to glean more information um, that's sort of embedded in these productions um, from society. We look at dance as well and ritual, and um, we look at the non-verbal as well. Now. I'm going to give you um, a presentation today looking at how children are learning to be digital in the world. And not just how children, but as our previous uh, speaker quite, quite rightly says, how we as, um, as learners of digital technology are taking on um, all these new innovations at such a speed. Um, and um, so I'm going to try to incorporate my talk with some audio, some visual, I've got a couple of clips of films and I'm finishing because my main, if you like, takeaway from today is how can anthropologists help in this idea of being inclusive in education, inclusive in the kind of technologies that we're trying to develop? In my company, we're using ethnographic methods to develop platforms for children in state schools to help them organize their knowledge. At the moment, there's so many links for children to understand, not even taken into account learning difficulties. Um, COVID showed us 
all the um, really unexpected demands of the digital world that we hadn't had previously. So we've really come to this um, perfect storm, but a perfect moment really to, to start really getting down to the point as the, the previous lady quite rightly said, what is it for? Is technology actually helping us? Um, and how can it help us? Um, so I'm going to share my screen and quite quickly show you a few clips of film. And please somebody shout if you're not seeing the film. Um, some of it's embedded. And at the end, I've got two clips and I've got a lovely student from India um, at the end who's going to present just a little bit of this wonderful film that she's used as a method to talk about COVID learning in India. So without further ado, um, I will share my screen with you. So share screen and here we go. And can you see, can you see that? Yeah, Great. yeah, I can okay. see it. So historical context, and I'm gonna outline some of the, well, the essential digital skills, the five essential digital skills that the government has set out that, that they see as necessary for every independent adult to know by the time they get to the workplace. Um, a few findings of what was happening during lockdown and to introduce the ethnographic method, method as a resource for educators and teachers working in education and to introduce ethnographic filmmaking, I think, as another essential tool for us all to know. So let me go ahead um, from here. So 60 years ago, Chronicle of a Summer was made by Jean Rouge. Jean Rouge was an anthropologist. And the reason he made this film is because he wanted to find out what people were doing post-war in Paris and what kind of society they were living in. Now, he was able to do this in this particular form because sync sound had just been invented. It was the first time that you could actually record and film at the same time. And so I'm going to show you a little short clip because this shows you how social methods have been integrated in visual representations and how we could learn from a classical filmmaker like Jean Rouge. Let me just share with you a few minutes um, which speaks about their experiment. Mais vécu par des hommes et des femmes qui ont donné des moments de leur existence à une expérience nouvelle de cinéma vérité. Comorin, euh, l'idée de réunir des gens autour d'une table est une excellente idée. Seulement, je ne sais pas si nous arriverons à enregistrer une conversation aussi normale qu'elle ne serait s'il n'y avait pas de caméra. Par exemple, je ne sais pas si Marceline arrivera à se décontracter, arrivera à parler absolument normal. Je vais pas essayer. Je crois que je vais pas m'expliquer. Pourquoi Parce que je suis un peu timide. Vous êtes, vous êtes intimidé par quoi Je suis intimidé parce que... À un moment donné, il faut être prêt que je ne suis pas forcément. En ce moment, vous n'êtes pas intimidé. Je non, tout de suite, quand même. Bon, alors, vous n'êtes pas intimidé maintenant. Ce que nous vous demandons, avec une grande ruse, Morin et moi, c'est simplement de parler, de répondre à nos questions. Euh, si vous dites des choses qui ne vous plaisent pas, il est toujours temps de couper. Vous ne voulez pas être intimidé. Mais je suis moi maintenant tout à l'heure parce que je n'ai pas été attaqué de fou, je crois. C'est ce brigand, là. Oui. Bon, alors, vas-y, vas-y, moi, bon, attaque. Bon, J'attaque quand même. Je ne sais pas la question qu'on va te poser. Nous même, très précisément, on ne sait pas non plus ce qu'on veut faire avec Rouge. C'est un film sur l'idée suivante. Comment vis-tu Comment vis-tu On commence par toi. Et après, on va s'adresser à d'autres. Comment vis-tu Ça veut dire comment est-ce que tu te débrouilles avec la vie. Et alors, hein, commence par toi, parce que tu vas participer d'une façon très intime à notre entreprise, à notre film. Et puisqu'il faut commencer, 
la journée. Par exemple, quand vous levez le matin, que faites-vous Je travaille. Quel travail Je fais des enquêtes de psychosociologie dans une boîte de psychosociologie appliquée. Je travaille à faire des interviews, d'analyser ces interviews, éventuellement refaire les synthèses. Ce qui m'absorbe quand même pas mal de temps, je crois. Ça vous intéresse Non, pas du tout. Lorsque euh, vous sortez dans la rue le matin, oui. est-ce que vous avez une idée de ce que vous allez faire dans la journée Écoutez, il arrive des fois quand je sors dans la rue le matin que j'ai des choses à faire. Mais il n'est absolument pas certain que je les fasse. Look at each other. So look at him here. One step here. And look at me. And look at him. Okay. And at three, clap your hands. Three, two, one, clap. There's a house floating. Oh, there's a house floating on your ear. So, so. Can you me? Hello? Hi, Alison, you're back Hi. now. I think you Great. lost it for a second. Great. Where did you where did you lose me? Only very, very recently. So it was fine until the end of that last video. So if oh, great. Start, Wonderful. start again. Wonderful. OK, so um, disadvantaged pupils tend to have a lower educational attainment compared with their peers. This is often called the disadvantage gap. School closures as a result of the COVID-19 are likely to have widened the disadvantage gap. This is because disadvantaged pupils tend to have less access to technology. They spend less time learning and have reduced support for parents, carers, compared with their peers. If you saw those two last clips, that was 60 years apart almost. Um, so we have um, a lady going into the street at the beginning um, where we're going to see her, her life and she was going to interview people with a microphone for the first time ever. And this was very shocking to the people she was interviewing. Um, 60 years later, children are looking through these virtual glasses. But as educators, where are we? How do we keep up with this technology? School education, from a government perspective, is always aimed at the masses. And up to now, budgets concentrated on facilities, lessons and faculty offered in a physical space. In the 21st century, pupils will be designing education for themselves. 21st century pupils will use platforms that enhance metacognition. Pupils are already designing their own education as they learn to use digital devices and explore apps and games in their daily lives. I'm going to play you an audio clip. Well, um, on, a, on a computer, I'm able to play, play games which can adapt to the computer or it can just be an online game for everyone to play. So if it adapts to the computer, it means that it will save everything that you've done. So if it's like an online thing, it will next time you go on the game, it will delete everything that you've done and it will start over. And it's some digital some digital skills I know um, is fast typing. Um, and and I know if someone says, can you get this up? I'm most likely going to find it. Because um, because if they if they tell you what they want you to find and you type that up, um, there would normally be a couple hundred questions and saying, do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want this? So there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of things um, that tell you, uh, do you mean this? Um, is it this you want? So yeah.
Okay, so that was a nine-year-old boy telling me how he felt fairly confident and how the, his gaming um, was quite useful to learn these digital skills. But as we know, pupils will need to adapt to tech changes at speed. Pupils need to engage in technology from an early age to become fluent in the digital world. They need to be active learners, self-reflective and motivated to ask questions. They need to seek different sources of answers and cross-reference skill sets. Here's another little bit of audio from a 12-year-old boy. In Minecraft story mode, you are the character in the story. It's like doing a play. You are the character and you are the writer as well. So you make the decision in the game. So that's him giving feedback about how his Minecraft playing has helped him understand about what a character is. And he's transferred that skill into learning about plays and stories. So we need really to understand, um, the, the children need to understand and recognize what works best for them. And they need to grow up to be confident, lifelong learners. And I think confidence is key here. So remember, remembering the digital revolution, that it wasn't until the 1990s that we had access to the internet at all. And the way we grew up, those of us born before 2000, um, we, we grew up with access to parks and theatres and museums, but all of our learning was really based on the needs of the material child, a child in presencia. And that before the disruption of digital media, mental models of the world were constructed in real time among peers where others inhabited the same physical space and sounds and smells to seeing were part of that experience. Interpersonal relations were tried and tested. Playgrounds and classrooms formed boundaries and safe spaces. Even if it was far from a perfect environment, it was stable and had been experienced by the teachers and governing bodies for generations. But as the 21st century settled in, we saw other purveyors of information taking our focus into computer led media outlets. We all became avid emailers without a lesson. And how many mistakes did we make there? We hooked on to online entertainment, and when YouTube was launched in 2005, we all entered into another unknown world, unfamiliar to a generation born before 1990, but completely normal to our children. So at the moment, we're, we're really um, experiencing this collision of generational knowledge. And from 2005, anyone with internet access could enter this world. And however old you were, you, if you could work the computer, you could get access to this text, vis visual audio content, which was first at work and then at home. And these boundaries were blurred. But children are growing up with this sense of normality with these blurred boundaries, and they're quicker at understanding these new functions and they are developing digital skills, but we still don't really know what they're learning. So the global pandemic was a big fast forward for digital children. Um, in 2018, just before the pandemic, the essential digital skills framework was outlined by the government. And the government said that we needed our children to be ready with these five essential skills when they leave school. They, they need to be able to do these things online, communicate, handle information and content, track, problem solve, and be safe and legal. Around a fifth of the UK population do not have these digital skills defined by the government. And research shows that there are many inequalities in digital skills, and those without formal qualifications are less likely to have digital skills for life. In 2020, we found that 93% of people with a university degree would have these skills, whereas 34% would not have those without formal qualifications. So adult and distance learning 
has been on for a relatively long time, almost as long as that film I showed you at the beginning. And it was born out of that easiness that we had to create films from the 60s, but it was still very much confined to certain people making films. It was not a democratic process at all. Very few people would have had cameras to make films and especially broadcast them. But the BBC, as we know, got together with the Open University and we have had adult distance learning since 1971. But the first online adult learning began in 1985, and that was for a very small amount of the public. 1995 held the first doctoral student, and MOOCs became a big thing from 2012 with massive open online courses. Now, these adult courses are always and still today, if we go to the London Business School, they will tell you they're user friendly, they're easy to navigate, you study at your own pace, there's time to familiarise learning processes, course overview, reminders, tutor feedback, assistance with technical resources. Now, this was developed, if you think about it, over a good 20 years, and then by MIT 2012. So before the pandemic, adults had had, those who were working with digital media in any way, had had some access to some guidelines on how to learn online. But during the pandemic, where were the guidelines for teachers and parents? What training did teachers and educators receive? And what about SEND pupils, pupils with disabilities and teachers who could not work on screens? What was the advice on blended learning or analog materials? I questioned this. I had four children at home, four with very different learning needs and I received no advice whatsoever. During 2020, the school lockdown began and there was a report that came out in the May of 2020 um, by the government, learning during the lockdown, real time data on children's experiences. And the big sort of takeaway from that was, yes, it's going to be disrupted. We're not quite sure how harmful it will be. And we know that um, there was no precedent in our modern times, I suppose, in our lifetime of this kind of situation. But we did have some precedent in adult education. So here were some of the feedbacks from that report. Primary and secondary students spend about five hours on average on home learning. Secondary school children will have more likely to on class and spend leisure time online. Higher income parents are more likely um, that then they're less well off to report that their school, schools provide online classes. 64% of secondary pupils from the richest household are being offered help. 47% from the poorest. 82% of secondary schools attending private school were offered help, 79 being online. Um, children in the highest income families spent five point hours a day on educational activities, but 30% less for the poorer families. So parents, of course, were struggling with this. 60% of parents um, from primary schools um, and nearly half of parents from secondary reported that were finding it hard or very hard to support this. And whatever strategy the government pursues after reopening, meaning now, there is still a risk of these increased inequalities. So that's all in a way the status quo. And there's been a fair amount of work within anthropology about anthropology and education. And I feel that anthropologists could really give some insight into how education may understand itself in the future. When you learn a new language or study cultures on their own terms, you're on your way to becoming an anthropologist. You construct alternative mental landscapes of the world or even new worlds which challenge your existing concepts. And just what just happened? This time the cultural others are not somewhere beyond, they're not from different ethnicities or different um, backgrounds, they're actually our own children. So this is a, we, we could help looking at this new digital culture. Um, 
This is um, a little, a tiny little extract from a film I made about what anthropologists are. And this is narrated by uh, Professor Alan McFarlane from the University of Cambridge. Anthropology is a very strange discipline because in most subjects like history or chemistry or whatever it is, you go and study objects out there and it doesn't really change you as a person. They are the past or your experiments. In anthropology, the whole point was you went out to a magical land. When you go to a tribal society like the Nagas or Highland New Guinea, you enter ma a magical world, which is something like our childhoods, rather like Alice uh, through the looking glass. Okay. Oh, sorry, move on. So um, the ethnographic method is a resource. I'm just going to give some general big um, statements here because I know time is short. So I'm just going to say that understanding the cultures of the digital we must really break it down into a more of a granular form that it's not just the digital world and us there are many types of digital worlds there's binary non-linear there's an interactive hci engagement immersion types of digital there's hypertextual um linked layered hypermediacy virtual postmodern blurring boundaries networked connected decentralized stimulated recreation representation and simulacra so there are many different types of ways that people are are interacting with the digital and anthropologists and the work that we're doing within digital anthropology really bring about certain ways of 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 going about field work um, we look we recognize that like culture, it changes. The consumer engagement experience changes. It's fluid and drastic changes are common. And like technology, digital practices evolve and transform. And a holistic understanding is key and also their ephemeral nature. So in anthropology, we have ethnographic method. Now, the, the, one of the key things in the ethnographic method is the participant observation method. And it means that you experience life, the life of the people you are studying. Um, you um, collect data by not just looking at the child's performance in school or on paper. We look at it in terms of home language and school language. We explain in simple language and often with the help of a translator. And we want the child or the children to participate in activities and, it, and understand what the point is of these activities. Obviously gaining permission or the ethical backgrounds that we do in any, any um, subject of a human subject study. Um, and we, we also spend time with the children and we learn their games. We learn what they're doing so that we can understand where they're coming from. We ask the children about their digital recreation and their online cultures. We don't see it as an us and them. We try to really get involved and understand um, what kind of games they're looking at and, and how these are affecting schoolwork. We participate and we observe and we create space for the child to voice opinions. So these are some of the things we translate as anthropologists, we translate culture, we try to see it on its own terms and we don't judge where people are coming from. We don't change the children's verbal expressions. If they have another use of a word, we use it because that might give more insight into what they're trying to tell us. And we ask them to respond to stories and illustrative messages. So these are a few of the other ones I can share with you later because I don't want to run out of time. Um, and we interpret, we interpret what's going on in its context, in its world. 
And um, for example, if we attempt to understand from a child's point of view, if the child does not want to learn online, we also use our empathetic knowledge. And we think, would I have wanted to sit at a desk for five hours a day when I was eight, year, eight years old? Um, why we mustn't be led by the digital, we lead it. And then we collaborate. Everything we do is we collaborate. And a couple of things here is that we include teachers, parents, grandparents in understanding the, um, the, the, the development of a child to try and close the information and the generation gap. And we try to communicate well. Um, we don't expect the children to do things that we wouldn't want to do ourselves. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you quickly to um, a film that my student has made. And really, this is the takeaway. If you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying just to tell them, which will lead to new ways of thinking. So I'm going to come out of this now, and I'm going to just let you see um, five or so minutes of my student's film. So this is called COVID Classroom. I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to reshare. Are you still with me, everybody? <laughs> yep. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to just share you this um, share screen so that we, um, okay, share screen. And I'm going to show you this is by a wonderful student who had not had any anthropological training apart from um, the ethnographic filmmaking course she came on this summer. She wanted to make a film about her experience and the experience of two um, lesser, um, let's say, um, lesser helped children um, in her community. Um, so we're going to see it. And then she's here if we could, if you have any questions. So this is just the beginning. It's a wonderful film of 35 minutes, and I'm sure she'd allow you to see it another time. Can you see the screen? It's been one and a half years since schools around the world have been forced to close their doors due to the COVID-19 pandemic. According to UNICEF, schools for more than 16 million children globally have been completely shut for most of the last academic year. As the death rate climbed, my school was quick to adapt to our rapidly changing world. I had all the support I could possibly need. Remote learning pools had been put in place, infrastructure and strategies on how me as a child of my school could learn in the most effective way possible. Along with all of this, I also had my family every step of the way. However, through it all, I couldn't help but wonder. If I had somehow not have access to any of this, none of the privileges I have access to simply because of circumstances I cannot control, how would I cope was all that I could ask. Unfortunately, this hypothetical question of mine is but a reality for millions of children from low-income backgrounds in India. How are they coping? And how much worse has our educational crisis become? Plato believed that education was a means for both individual and social justice. To achieve social justice, he argues, we must all work in harmony. This, he opines, can be achieved by equal educational opportunities for all. Without this, we may see the emergence of a tyrannical society ran by unqualified people. The importance of education is nothing unheard of, which is why now more than ever, people and government are willing to invest in a quality education or educational opportunities and infrastructure for all. However, it is important to realize that ultimately, no matter how much you spend or theorize, it all boils down to what actually happens in the classroom. It is with this intention that I decided to examine an actual classroom to see how the learning is actually taking place amidst the COVID crisis. 
Over the next 30 minutes, I will be presenting a case study. A COVID classroom to the eyes of a 16 year old right before you. This is a case study of a brother and a sister who despite the COVID crisis and all the difficulties that came with it, try their best to keep their fire for learning alive. In order to conduct the study effectively, I decided to try and learn the fundamentals of and train myself in educational research. From my understanding, one of the most critical aspects of educational research or research in general is research ethics. The inherent need to respect people's data and privacy is especially relevant here when working with children, which is why even though I have taken the informed consent of both parents and children, I have chosen to keep their identities anonymous. I felt that perhaps their consent was tainted by the fact that they may have felt compelled to do so. Furthermore, I believe that their identities are irrelevant in comparison to their story, as it is a story shared by millions of children all around the world. I have thus given them new names to protect their identity. I have named the girl Asha, which means hope in Hindi. This represents the hope that is still there despite all of the difficulties that have come in their educational journey. The boy I've named Bala, which represents the strength that they have and will need in their educational journey. In his thesis, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire states that to be educated is to escape from the necrophilic clutches of oppression. He continues this line of thought by saying that to question is what humanizes us. On the first day of recording, I was eager to see the power of education at first hand. With excitement and slight apprehension, I walked up the stairs. Their home consisted of one room and a bathroom. Whatever was overflowing in terms of this household was neatly compartmentalized into the carry bags that hung off the wall. And of course, there was one small window to see the outside world. And in the midst of it all was a classroom, a classroom that many people would not be able to recognize. Whilst considering on our learning, our focus is fixated on the mobile rather than the learning environment that it rests in. Frederick Vogel constantly stressed on the learning environment of a child. Okay, so I've um, just, um, that was, a, it's difficult sometimes to know at which point to bring you into a film when you're not watching the whole film. But what I wanted to include there, rather than explain to you the methodologies that we use, was to show you the methodologies that we use. So Navia Sara is here, and I just wanted to ask her three questions to give you a little bit of the feedback of the ethnographic method within the audiovisual. So welcome, Navia. Yes, Sarah, thank you for joining us from India this evening. Thank you for having me. Okay, well done. Um, so I, I had um, a couple of questions about the use of um, the camera and the use of audio came an eth ethnographic filmmaker so we've only got five minutes but we'll just maybe um explain to people who would not perhaps be familiar with this method what how you sort of learned from that kind of workshop um to tell your story about the children yeah so um i don't really have much experience in anthropology but um the, there's a lot of overlapping between visual anthropology and documentary making, and I learned a lot about, I think Alison also mentioned uh, just now, the participatory mode uh, of filmmaking, uh, and which basically includes the perspective of the filmmaker. Um, so that's one thing that I um, used in my documentary. Um, along with this, um, I learned a lot about um, camera angles and um, how they could possibly um, convey a power dynamic. So um, if my camera angle is looking from 
above to someone below me, it kind of insinuates that I'm looking down on them. So that's just um, an example of how um, you have to be mindful and sensitive to the people who you are um, asking questions from or recording. Um, so um, I made sure to keep my documentary at eye level so that I wasn't disrespecting anybody. Um, I also ensured uh, to uh, take the consent of everybody that I was uh, recording so that I didn't disrespect them in any way. Um, I also um, learned about the visual impact of um, film and uh, it kind of informed my decision to make this into a documentary and not a research paper or an article because simply because of the visual impact. Um, and you can see it in movements, um, for example, like in the civil rights movement, uh, the use of photos, there is a lot of use of photos to convey this emotional impact on people, and it worked very effectively. And also, I wanted to uh, share it with a wider audience because it's more easily communicated and understood and, um, you know, kind of uh, surpasses any boundaries that you know, prevents people from like reading research papers and, you know, all that. Wow. Thank so you awesome. very much, Arya. Yeah, Sarah, um, if you, um, it's a shame, if you wanted to watch um, the film uh, complete, I'm, I'm sure we'll ask Navia Sarah if, if anybody would like to see that, but she really captures, and, and um, we didn't quite get to that bit, uh, the, the frustration of these children who were sharing a mobile phone between them and how the teachers were really trying to get information across, but the noise outside was interfering. And these, it was very symbolic of all the noise that was going on around families during COVID and really demonstrated it was a one size fits all. And if you can't grasp what was going on there and then you were lost. Um, and so I think this was really well illustrated that whole corporeal holistic understanding of the experience of, of, of the digital classroom and um, how so many people would, would not get any learning out of it. And Navia Sarah's reflective account all the way through is very self-reflexive. And I think as a 16 year old um, who has really learned about the meta of, of, of um, learning, it, I think this film is a very good example of a simple methodology that tells us an awful lot about um, some of the innovations that might be needed to connect the, the message with the learner in the future. So I better stop there. Thank you so much for joining us, Navi Asara, and maybe um, we'll continue to talk about certain things in the next session. Thank you, Eve. I'll stop Thank there. you so much. I'm sorry I had to cut that short, but I, I'd love to see the whole movie. Yeah. I think, you know, especially some of the elements you, you brought forward, were, you know, I think it really made me think about the digital divide, isn't it? It's the whole issue with education being a risk factor for early dependency, morbidity. And it is that that also inhibits access to digital means and, and perhaps digital understanding. So how to work with this? I think both of you have really given a good handle on really and it's something that came up with what tracy said earlier is to work from the people you're developing this for because a lot of apps a lot of technology is developed by uh, nerds who you know come up with great and wonderful ideas but it's that translation to the people we're actually designing it for to enable them to work and something you brought up, Navishara, which is really important, is that a lot of people won't have access. And something you brought up, um, you know, Alison, that poor families perhaps will not have access to a uh, laptop. So who's going to pay for this? Who will provide that access? Is there any way? You know, it's something we need to think about because with more libraries closing, this further inhibits access to... Uh, you know, uh, online um, availability. Exactly. And also this sole dependency. Mm. I think 
think this is a, you know it's a um, bit of a red herring sometimes um but your many generations have learned an awful lot from reading writing drawing from the library exactly and, yeah. and suddenly turning everything over to digital it may have been better to spend money buying people books and finding extra tuition for smaller groups rather than this one size fits all get online for five hours a day um analog can work as well so we're looking yeah. at blended learning as well um and and the idea of um not putting everything over to the digital and i think um some of the well i mean in Aviasara shows you the coping skills of those children were more important in a way than what they were learning on screen because the way they were sharing the way they were you know they were mm. on their own all day mm. they were age nine and eleven and Nebiasara was 16 so and how brilliantly that little group of children work together to yeah. create this movie yeah you know that is another what an amazing thing to have been able to organize so these are other skills kind of beyond the beyond the margins mm. that, that are not tested in the way that um you know that the, the education system is testing there there are many skills that that children need to learn that okay. go beyond um the text and i think many people have known that for years but this this relates also to something we found we, we years ago we did a program for older people and digital inclusion and people were found to learn best from their peers it's because you speak that same language don't you like your kids together never share a work together you know speaking that same language understanding that place where, where they're coming from I'm going to not open up the discussion because I'm mindful of the time at this point, but I want to keep have everybody like I've made lots of notes on my form. Uh, please, you know, thoughts you have about the wonderful lecture that Alison gave and and Navashara, you know, your 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 movie was very very impressive, and I'm I'm really sorry I cut that short, but no, it's, no, we, it's we, we I, knew that you would only have five minutes, so don't yeah, worry. But it, it, what what I saw really made me want to look at this. This is this is amazing. It's an amazing job, you know, that you you managed to do that. Kudos to you. Um, I'm going to continue with the next speaker. Thank you so much, Alison. And uh, our next speaker, so we now have a couple of short talks. And the next speaker is Lucy Bation, and she's from Leicester. Uh, and she'll be talking about cognitive uh, training uh, using mixed methods uh, to prevent dementia and dependency. Um, let me see if we can share your. Um, Felicity did. Um, Felicity did. Um, I've emailed it to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll just quickly. There we go. Oh, yes. Yeah. See, here we're working very closely together, Lucy and I. Team effort. Team effort. Okay. Um, share screen. Let me. It's this one, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Okay, dokie. Lucy, thank you. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Lucy, um, as you've introduced me. Um, the last talk was quite a hard act to follow. I really enjoyed it, um, but I'm going to change tack slightly and talk a bit about some of the work for my PhD um, that I've been doing on a Dunhill Clinical Research Fellow. Um, this is just one part of it, but this is the mixed method analysis of, a, of the cognition and flow study that I ran. Um, so as you're all aware, there's a, we've got an aging population um, and in clinic at the moment with people living with dementia, we have very little to offer them in terms of 
good treatments or indeed preventative strategies for, for older people that are worried about developing dementia or at risk of. Um, cognitive training is one of these um, treatments that there's been a lot of interest around recently, um, possibly because it's maybe a bit cheaper than developing a um, pharmacological sort of drug target, um, and possibly also that there's fewer side effects, but I'll come on to some of the, the issues around that um, in this talk. Um, while there's been quite a lot of studies looking at cognitive training, there's fewer that have looked at brain imaging, so the mechanisms by which cognitive training might be beneficial or sort of repetitive brain kind of stimulation or training. Um, and in particular, there aren't many that focus on blood flow or vascular mechanisms associated with dementia. Um, and that's something that's become of increasing interest in recent years, um, both in Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. There's signs that sort of reduced blood flow could be quite important. So the aim of this study was really to try and address that evidence gap and look at the effects that cognitive training has on vascular physiology in the brain. So this was a mixed method study. Um, it had an overarching quantitative design, which was a feasibility randomized control trial. Um, so participants came for an initial assessment, um, underwent either a cognitive training invest, uh, intervention or were randomized to um, a sort of waiting list control. That was for 12 weeks and then they returned for a follow-up assessment. Um, participants who completed the training were then invited to do an interview study. So we did semi-structured interviews um, and um, ultimately we then integrated the data using joint displays to try and profile participants based on their quantitative and qualitative outcomes. So we recruited 20 healthy older adults, um, 20 people, 24 people living with Alzheimer's disease and 12 um, people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, and as I said, we randomised them to one of the two conditions. The training programme was provided by Lumosity and it was um, targeting five key cognitive domains, which we mirrored in the vascular sort of blood flow assessment, uh, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, this study looks at half of these participants because we only investigate, we only interviewed the people that completed the training. Um, so the outcomes for the study we looked at, we looked at cognition, so we used the Adam Brooks cognitive examination, we looked at mood using the geriatric depression scale, quality of life using the DEMQOL, DEMQOL and the function using the Lawton IADL. Um, we also conducted a brain blood flow assessment on all the participants, so you can see a picture of me sporting our transcranial Doppler system, which is um, an ultrasound based way of measuring brain blood flow. It's quite nice for people living with dementia because you don't have to put them through a scanner. You can interact with them the whole time. Um, there's no radiation involved. And also you can do tasks with people. So this is a, a picture of me kind of doing a, a cognitive kind of test from, um, from the Adam Brooks with um, one of my colleagues. Um, and we used that, we looked at five different cognitive tests to try and stimulate blood flow. Um, and what you can see in the bottom hand of the screen is a raw kind of trace file of a, of a blood flow um, that we would see on an ultrasound scan. Um, what we then did was we classified people into two groups. So we looked at people who were either low adherers to cognitive training and those that were high adherers. And we, we used a cutoff of 20 hours of training for that. Um, and we also classified people in their pattern of blood flow response. So people that increased their blood flow responses after training, people where they stayed the same and people where they decreased. And then we use joint displays to kind of integrate the, the data from the blood flow information, but also from the interview information. So the aims of this analysis were to look at how the qualitative results from the interview study explain kind of dropouts and um, non-adherence to, to the training program and whether the baseline character, characteristics of the people um, who dropped out, whether that can also help predict, predict that. Um, we then looked at the quantitative and qualitative profiles, so looked at the outcome measures to see are there some patients or some participants that benefit more than other people, um, and what recommendations can we maybe draw from um, what we learned from this study. So um, we had five participants who were classified as low adherence on the training, so less than 20 hours, um, and they were median training was around 17 hours compared to nearly 40 hours in the high adherence. So there was quite a, a reasonable difference. And three participants with Alzheimer's disease dropped out from the training quite early on. Um, the high adherers were by and large were healthy participants, mild cognitive impairment, and then five with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in terms of the low adherers, the majority as expected were, were Alzheimer's disease participants, one with MCI. And there's one healthy participant that was a bit of an anom anomaly who, had, had good adherence but had very few benefits both quantitatively and qualitatively so we kind of analysed them with this group because they their profile sat better with this group. So in the low adherence group most of the, the participants were male, um, 
they tended to be older, um, but they had reasonable years of education. Um, the, ma the majority were on anti-dementia drugs, but interestingly, a lot were, had quite mild Alzheimer's disease. So the, the average ACE 3 score was 80, which isn't, isn't too bad, actually. Um, there did tend to be more barriers amongst the low adherers, as one would expect, um, and these tended to be less modifiable. So there were things that the patients couldn't really change, the severity of the dementia, perhaps they had apathy, they lacked insight into their dementia, and they were often quite reliant on the carers for support through the programme as well. Whereas the high adherers tended to have fewer barriers and they were more modifiable, so things that they could do something about, like minimising um, noise and distractions, finding a suitable environment for the training, um, those kind of things. Um, as I said, there was greater need for carer support amongst the um, low adherence group, which then resulted in some carer friction and strain, which, which could be a problem. Um, and those participants tend to be less resilient to problems or issues. So when things did arise, they didn't have the coping skills or the mechanisms perhaps to deal with them um, or find strategies to try and improve things or sort them out. So these are just some example quotes from participants in my study. So for example, a healthy participant said, even though they were frustrating, I enjoyed doing them because I wanted to do them better or get a better score because I knew I could do them. So that participant had quite high self-efficacy um, throughout the training, which helped motivate them to, to continue to do it. Similarly, um, a participant with mild cognitive impairment um, said, just because I don't like a game doesn't mean to say that you should stop doing it, because um, I've got to keep getting used to it, haven't I? Um, respond to the challenge. So they sort of saw that there was a challenge that um, they wanted to meet. Um, and they also had obviously quite high motivation to be able to get through the problems that they were having. This was quite in contrast to my participants with Alzheimer's disease um, at the bottom where for example, a carer saying that he got irritated with me trying to get him to do them. So that's that carer friction coming out where they were trying to provide support, but finding it quite challenging. Um, and another carer of a participant with Alzheimer's disease saying um, that they used to love doing crosswords and Sudoku, um, but now they have no interest in that. So that's that apathy sort of lack of motivation coming through that, that could be quite difficult for participants. Um, so just to show you a bit of um, a snap, sort of snapshot of data from the joint displays in the participants who had increased blood flow responses uh, tended to be participants with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. Um, and they mostly had stable or improved cognition, quality of life and mood. But there was a bit of a, a mixed bag of both positive and negative qualitative experiences. Um, and three of these participants were actually low adherers to the training. Um, and this is just an example of a participant that had an increase in blood flow, um, had a bit of mixed responses on some of the other qualitative outcomes, um, but were actually quite pleased and happy with how they did on the training. They had more good days than bad. They felt challenged. But at the same time, they could be frustrated and depressed um, with difficult exercises. So there was quite a lot of mixed um, um, sort of emotions coming out of the, um, the qualitative interviews. In terms of the neutral... So these are participants that didn't have an increase or a decrease in their blood flow after training. Um, most were healthy, um, had very few quantitative benefits um, that we could measure, um, but most of the qualitative experiences were quite positive. So things that were coming out there were that they thought it was good to have an active mind to sort of keep stimulated. They were taught like routines and strategies that they could use, um, and they found that they learned things and they enjoyed it as well. And most of them didn't um, identify any self-reported improvements either, which did align with the, what we saw quantitatively on the sort of the questionnaires that we did with them. Um, and in terms of the reduced blood flow response group, interestingly, again, this was mostly healthy and mild quantum impairment um, participants uh, with some quantitative benefits and generally sort of quite po positive qualitative benefits. Um, interestingly, frustration was a, a theme that we saw across all of the groups. Um, and that did tend to be around the use of technology um, and particularly if there were software problems or things weren't quite, quite going right with the programme that particularly they felt were out of their control. So what we we set out to look for a profile of a participant to say, to say that they, they might be, that's who we might target training towards. And actually what we found was there was no particular profile that predicted somebody who would get more benefits from the training. Um, and actually those with low adherence, so people living with Alzheimer's disease could have both quantitative and qualitative benefits. Um, and there was quite, for a number of participants, those positive experiences outweighed the negative experiences. So really what I think we learned from this was that a tailored approach is, is needed to training and that just because you're a low adherer doesn't necessarily mean that you perhaps shouldn't be engaging with these activities because there could still be benefits for them. So these were some of the recommendations that we kind of came up with as a result of the study. So 
perhaps it might be if you identified a, a participant or a patient for cognitive intervention, there could be a series of um, key risk factors for not engaging well with the programme. And these were the ones that we picked out from um, our kind of interview study and our mixed method analysis. And this could then lead on to um, classifying people who had few or few barriers and high barriers. Importantly, amongst the few barrier group, um, so people who are more likely to engage with training, you still need, there is important things that you need to consider. So um, they're likely to cope with higher difficulty levels and they're likely to need more rapid progression of the training. And if they don't have that, they're probably going to get demotivated if the progression is too slow. And both groups need quite significant personalised feedback. That was something that was really important from um, all of the participants in the study um, on how they were doing and how their brain was, was responding, not just um, how they were doing generically. Um, for the significant barriers group, we sort of suggested that maybe treating coexisting problems such as anxiety and depression might be important. Um, definitely considering early cessation for the three participants that I had that struggled, we just stopped the training straight away because um, they were having quite significant side effects from it. Um, then it's probably going to need more support, particularly for carers, where there's a lot of carer reliance, um, because that can cause a lot of extra strain and friction. Um, and it's important to have a supportive and motivation environment for participants. And interestingly, quite a lot of this sort of feeds into this technology aspect we're talking about. Quite a few participants said they would like to start with paper and pen exercises. Perhaps that's because that's what they're more used to and then graduate that into a technological um, programme um, rather than going because they found that trying to learn the computer as well as learning a programme was too much, it sort of overwhelms them all at once. So perhaps learning the exercises and then transferring it to a computer might be easier for them. Um, but those were some of the things that we, that came out of that. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I had a lot of support to do this study from all my supervisors, from the Outside Society, the Dunhill Trust, and my patient and public involvement group. Um, I think most of the papers are out now or in preprint, so you can access those online. Um, I'm also happy to answer if you want to get in touch with me at any point um, to talk about maybe taking this to the next sort of stage, I'd be interested to hear from people. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask people if they have questions. That was really good. Lots of food for thought. Um, any any questions from the audience from from here? You you guys in 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 life? Yes, Tracy. It's interesting that the care is the one that's some friction there. That's mm. exactly what you said. That's the cool one because it has to be a holistic approach for yeah. everybody. Yeah, I guess there's correlation there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I thought um, what was really interesting was to sort of try to identify, and that, that, that very much links into how we set up the talks, where we're looking now at level of ability and mm. digital literacy, and then our next talk will be on that sensory mm. deficit, like the visual deficits, yeah. because it's very hard. What are you going to do? And the literacy mm. and, 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 and previous experience. And also, as you mentioned, those those challenging behaviours, the depression, mm -hmm. the apathy, and mm -hmm. how to overcome that. Yeah. Have you got any ideas on on what you found when you were doing this program? What what came out? Yeah, so I, I actually ended up doing some home visits to go and set up the technology in well, set the mm -hmm. training up in mm -hmm. their home on their computer because it. <laughs> The, being able to run it varied by operating system, um, how and most of the computers were ancient. Um, luckily, the program could run on a very old system. Right. But that's a challenge. So if, if it only runs on modern computers yes. or modern systems, that's quite difficult. Mm. Most patients preferred to use their own computer. So I did have laptops available to use in the study and most preferred it to be set up on their home computer because that's what they were familiar with. Mm -hmm. And again, I think with when you're living with dementia, any Thing extra that you have to add on to something is, is another thing so that's what they were saying to me it's the, the additive effect of learning technology plus the program that's right um, on top so then if you had a new technology that they weren't used to plus the program it was going to be it was quite overwhelming for them um, mm -hmm. the carers were really good um, as part of the study and they but it, for some of them it was quite a significant amount of effort particularly mm -hmm. where there was as I say the apathy um, or getting quite frustrated and it often got taken out on the carer so mm -hmm, I had mm -hmm. to be very mindful of that through the study when I was supporting them to mm -hmm. make sure um, 
I mean, I think that's going to be a challenge for, for patients where you have those mm. those kind of issues. What about the program itself? This luminosity. It, yeah. it, 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 is it, <laughs> what I got back from the quality it was like, well, it's really boring, but we got to do it. Is there any way that you could come up with something more fun? Yeah. Um, so but what was yeah, it? The program. It was mixture. So most of the most of the people actually quite enjoyed it. They were they were sort of okay. like brain game exercises. Mm -hmm. I think the 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 main thing was they were getting quite frustrated. There was a lot of bugs in the program. Oh. So they were getting frustrated with the bug issue. Um, so on the whole, they liked, I mean, the it's not the most flexible. So I was able to select from a range of exercises, which is what I did. And I selected ones to target certain brain areas so that I can map that to the blood flow responses. Um, but um, I think that what, what was really coming out of it was that participants it would give them this score, which was entirely, seemed to be entirely random. It was a huge number. It seemed to be completely not relative to anything it was irrelevant to them and they just said i want to know how my is my brain yeah. improving what's you know what's going yeah. on and i think there are some training programs that are better at that so i think maybe brain hq gives you like brain health scores things like that and i think that that participants really like that but as, if it's too generic and it's just a random number they just they lose interest absolutely it. as yeah. you would uh, but i think uh, making it coming back to what Alison said about the kids mm -hmm. using figurative material cartoons yeah. you know yeah. um, making it not 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 being very careful not to make it infantile yeah but um, coming up with something that's easy to yeah. understand you improve yeah you know uh, 30 percent a lot of people will understand the bar that goes yeah. up you know making something a little bit more uh, uh, personal a and, and b understandable a few mm -hmm. participants mm -hmm. said that they at first thought they felt a bit patronized by the program uh, because they said it did look a bit childish a bit game like mm -hmm. um and then but then a few said that then as they progressed through it they realized actually it wasn't and it was mm -hmm. quite hard <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that was more so amongst the healthy older adults that felt more patronized i'd say mm -hmm. than the people i think the people with dementia were just too busy trying to understand it all whereas um Ooh. the healthy participants found it um initially and then they said mm -hmm. once they worked through it and they got to the higher levels and i think that's the thing about it progressing fast enough mm -hmm. for them yeah yeah i remember years ago there was a an online incredibly successful word uh, worldwide program uh, for kids to do mathematics online and you progressed levels and it was very good it, it was an online uh, web-based game and you could play against other children and you saw how well you did in the ranking mm. um, but it was a lot of fun but this is something that came out of our exercise program so remember, years ago we had um, about physical activity for people with dementia and the main thing that came out was it has to be fun mm. and you got to have a sense of progress yeah. um, because if you don't and you yeah. don't have that self-efficacy you mentioned yeah then it doesn't work yeah. great great talk lucy thank you so much thank you uh, that was wonderful um again if you have questions um comments put them on your form we'll have a lot of time to talk about uh issues during the sand pit uh keep your questions there or put them in the uh chat and then lucy can have a look at the chat and see if she wants to uh, wants to well if you, if you if you, <laughs> if, she, if she can answer them uh, in the chat um, the next talk is uh, a talk by um, Dr. David Maidman who um, has I'm going to see Luce, uh, Felicity if we can share that so David really wanted to be here but he's organizing a conference of his own right now. So, so that didn't really work so well together, but he very kindly um, sent us his talk and he is going to talk about a platform. Uh, David is a, a lecturer at Loughborough University and his speciality with um, some other people like Rose Daly and Christian Fulgrub it, and Mar Maria Goodwin is in hearing and how that pertains to interaction with digital technology and uh, dementia risk. Um, can you see his talk? I'm assuming that is a yes. Hello, I am Dr. David Maitland, a lecturer in psychology within the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. 
Now, I'm really sorry that I can't be there live at the event today. I'm actually attending another conference in Manchester. But today I'm going to present some research that I completed a couple of years ago when I was working at the University of Nottingham, looking at the power of mobile technologies, or ML for short, to enhance hearing loss self-management in older adults. Now, why are we interested in enhancing hearing loss self-management? Well, one of the main reasons is because hearing aid adoption and use is extremely low. So a large proportion of older adults who would benefit from using hearing aids fail to adopt them. And for those that do adopt them, a large number fail to use them regularly. Now, there are a whole host of reasons why this is, this is the case. And I'm showing you here just a selection that have been identified from the literature. So as you can appreciate, this is a very complex and multifaceted issue. Nevertheless, one of the key reasons that hearing aid use and adherence is so poor is because knowledge is very low in the general population with regards to hearing aids and hearing loss. Now, if we, if we look at first-time hearing aid users, for instance, they often experience a lot of difficulties using their hearing aids. And this is because they often struggle to remember or recall all of the information that's been given to them during their hearing aid fitting appointment by a clinician or audiologist. Now, this doesn't only apply to first-time users. So the literature has also shown us that existing hearing aid users, their knowledge is extremely variable ranging from poor to excellent with regard to hearing aid handling. Now, the reason for this is because information typically delivered in clinic is delivered via verbal means. And this is problematic because often information can be forgotten or retained incorrectly. Now, to combat this, the team in Nottingham developed a series of educational uh, reusable learning objects, or RLOs for short. Now, RLOs are simply put interactive chunks of multimedia that contain uh, animations, video clips, uh, patient testimonials, and a lot more. Now, if you'd like to access these, these are freely uh, available uh, on YouTube via the link I'm showing you on the slide. Now, the videos contained a range of different topics which were prioritised by hearing healthcare professionals and patients. So some of the topics included practical hearing aid handling skills, such as how to insert your hearing aids, hearing aid care and maintenance, as well as psychosocial problems, uh, including communication tactics and acclimatisation, so how to get used to hearing through a hearing aid. Now, this was subsequently evaluated by the team and they were shown to be clinically effective. So, using a registered randomized control trial design, uh, recruiting 203 first time hearing aid users, the research showed that those that were given the RLOs at the time of hearing aid fitting demonstrated superior practical hearing aid and handling skills. This is compared to the, uh, a weightless control who didn't receive the videos. They also demonstrated better knowledge of hearing aids and communication greater hearing aid use, particularly in those that didn't report wearing their hearing aids all of the time, and also improved confidence or self-efficacy for using hearing aids. And if you'd like to access any of these resources, again, they're also freely available on a dedicated website, c2hearonline.com. Now, critically, there are some limitations to the original RLOs, which we subsequently branded c 2 hear now, they were originally developed for a DVD-based platform because at the time of development, which was almost a decade ago now, we found that internet use in, uh, in first-time hearing aid users was rather low. Uh, in addition to this, the opportunities for individualization and interactivity were rather limited, again, because of this DVD-based platform. Furthermore, the average length of these videos was approximately eight minutes. And for some who took part in the original trial, this was too long and it actually hindered them being able to locate the desired information with ease. And again, as I've mentioned, there were limited opportunities to actively engage with the content during learning. And research has shown that active engagement and interactivity with learning materials can actually enhance learning potential and subsequent retention and recall of that information. So, as a possible way of addressing some of these limitations, we turned to mobile technologies as a potential intervention. 
Now, mobile technologies, or mHealth, which refers to the delivery of healthcare via mobile technologies such as smartphones, tablets, uh, PCs, and computers, for instance, um, have shown that these types of technology uh, can enable greater individualization and interactivity, which I mentioned earlier can actually enhance learning potential. Now, critically, uh, when we were developing this research in the late uh, 2010s, so around 2017, 2018, smartphones, particularly in older adults, were becoming ubiquitous. And what we mean by that is that they were becoming everywhere. So we were finding that a large number of older adults uh, who were using hearing aids for the first time owned or had access to smartphone technologies. Therefore, we assume that opportunities for using mHealth to deliver hearing health care and education are increasing year on year. So to this end, we developed a further resource which we termed M to Hear. And if you're interested in looking at the development process, it's recently been published in the International Journal of Audiology. Now we took two steps to developing M to Hear. So based on the original C to Hear intervention, we identified active ingredients that facilitated the intended target behavior, which was hearing aid use. And this was theoretic theoretically grounded using a contemporary model from health behavior change, the COMBI uh, model, and accompanying theoretical debate framework. Now, in the development process, this was also supplemented by using an iterative, user-centered and participatory design approach, where we developed uh, prototype versions of the mHealth platform, and we asked users to interact with it, where we could identify any potential issues or problems, uh, to ultimately deliver an individualized learning and increased interactivity platform for, for use to enhance learning potential. And what I'm showing you here is some screen grabs from, uh, from the M Health platform, M to Here, which included individualized and interactive components. So the first component that was individualized was the opportunity to choose your ear mold coupling. So an open fit shown on the left or a closed ear mold, uh, custom ear mold fit on the right. And this would then tailor the information accordingly to the user's hearing aid. Users then were shown this screen, so there were five high level categories referring to aspects of the patient pathway, such as using hearing aids, getting used to them, looking after them, communication with others, and using phones and other devices with the hearing aid. They could also select uh, from a whole host of videos that they wanted to watch, and the intervention, the uh, mHealth uh, platform tracked what was used, what was watched. And this is showing you an example of a time activity or quiz that was embedded within the resource itself. And again, if you want to scan that QR code, you can take a look at M to Hear in your own time. Now, critically, we wanted to establish the feasibility of using this intervention, particularly in terms of its delivery, accessibility, usability, and uh, looking at self-reported outcomes in first-time hearing aid users. So to this end, 59 first-time hearing aid users were recruited from the, uh, the clinic in Nottingham, uh, within the Nottingham University Hospitals NHS Trust. And I'm showing you a figure here uh, of the mean ages, gender, the levels of hearing loss, and their computer skill level. And generally, this is typical uh, of the first time hearing aid user group. In terms of our study design, individuals were first fitted with a hearing aid. They completed some baseline questionnaires or some outcome measures. They then went away uh, and used M to Hear uh, independently in their own homes for a period of 10 to 12 weeks. They then came back and recompleted uh, the questionnaires that they, that they completed at baseline. So that was our follow up. Now let's have a look at delivery, accessibility, and usability first of all. So during that 10 to 12 week period, we can see that smartphone technologies were used by the majority of participants in order to access M to Hear. So a large proportion, 41% either used uh, a tablet with 36 using a laptop uh, and a lesser degree individuals using either a smartphone or a desktop computer. Critically, all participants visited uh, m to hear at least once during this time uh, with 178 total uh, hits we were able to monitor. We found that 65% used m to hear on at least two or more occasions with over, over half going back continually on three or more occasions, so suggesting repeated use. 
In addition, usability was rated extremely high by participants. Uh, so the measure that we used would have classed it as above average in terms of its usability. And I really thought that that's a testament to the iterative usability testing that we did in the development process. If we look at some outcomes then, we use the hearing handicap inventory for the elderly to look at hearing related quality of life. And we can see here the green, which is before hearing aid fitting, and then red, 10 to 12 weeks post hearing aid fitting. We can see that this significantly reduced with a large effect size. And this reduction is much larger than we would have expected from just being fitted with hearing aids alone. In addition to hearing aid, uh, hearing related quality of life, Self-efficacy or confidence for using hearing aids also significantly improved, improved again with a very large effect size. And finally, if we look at hearing aid knowledge, uh, handling skills and practical handling, handling skills, again we can see here that uh, score significantly improved after use of M to, M to Hear, again with a very large effect size. So just to conclude then, uh, what we've shown here is that uh, M Health, which is delivered, uh, M, uh, M to Hear, sorry, which is delivered by mobile technologies is an effective M Health intervention. So uh, during our feasibility study, we were able to show that it was consistently used on tablets and laptops, suggesting that M, M Health interventions are suitable in first time hearing aid users and are, cert and are certainly feasible in terms of acceptability. The intervention was also accessed on many different occasions by over two thirds of the sample, suggesting that uh, participants were going back to the m to hear resource in order to self-manage their hearing loss and their hearing aids. Usability was also rated highly, which again I mentioned possibly reflects the user-centered co-production approach taken when we were developing the resource. And our outcome measures also showed a range of benefits of hearing aids, plus using m to hear so as I mentioned, the effect sizes were much larger than we would typically see from just being given hearing aids alone. So therefore, we conclude that m may have had additional incremental benefits and certainly demonstrates the power of m health technologies to self-manage hearing loss. Finally, I want to thank all of uh, my colleagues who uh, were involved in, uh, in this research and our funding bodies. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any queries or you'd like to access any of the publications that I've cited in today's presentation, then please do email me. Thank you uh, for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's event. Bye-bye. Wow, that was a great talk. Um, I'm just going to stop that sharing. So that was that was really good from David. I think, again, uh, here we can we can hear the, about the importance of actually involving the users at a very early stage and seeing if if things actually work. And I think his um, one of the most important elements out of today is to look at what worked for the people we're actually designing these technologies for. Um, the next talk uh, is by uh, Dr. Claudio Di Lorito, and he's going to be talking about the work they did for Praised, which is promoting activity, independence, and stability in early dementia. Uh, Claudio, uh, would you like to uh, share your screen, please? Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. It should be all right. You should see it. Yeah. You sh is, does everybody see it? Just a quick squeak. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Brilliant. You? So, uh, thank you. Um, so today I'll be talking um, how we try to keep our participants active through tele rehab during the COVID nineteen pandemic. And as he just mentioned, these are some results from the promoting activity, um, independence and stability in early dementia uh, study. So today's session will be divided um, into six parts. So the first thing I'll try to do is give you a little bit of introduction around PRAISED, what it is and what we're trying to do. The second section will be around how the COVID-19 pandemic hit uh, PRAISED as well and the ongoing study and how we try to um, address the challenges. Um, the third part will be specifically about one of the research sites within Praised who have been to deliver the intervention through uh, tele-rehab. Um, 
the fourth part will be around the case study that we presented and it's part of this presentation today around the experience of this specific service of delivering tele-rehab. And finally, I'll try to derive some uh, basic implications for future uh, clinical practice and hopefully some ideas for um, the sandpit that we're having today as well. And, and of course, I'll be happy to take your questions, but also your feedback. That would be great. So PRAISED. PRAISED stands for Promoting Activity, Independence and Stability in Early Dementia. This is a program where we're trying to deliver physical activity, um, physical exercises and dual task exercises, uh, as well as functional activities of daily living to people living with dementia. There are some examples of the kind of exercises that we're doing in PRAISE in the link uh, that I put here below. So uh, feel free to explore in your own time. Um, this program is intended to be, and I say intended because obviously with COVID we had some issues, it is intended to be delivered in the participants' homes by a multidisciplinary team uh, made up of physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and rehabilitation support workers, and lasts one year. So that's the involvement of the participant in praise. The therapist, the idea is that they co-develop, so together with participants, but also the family, they will develop um, a tailored program, but also a set of final goals based on the participants' needs and aspirations to be achieved at the end of the, of the program. Um, our participants are then asked to follow the program that they've designed, oops, um, independently, um, in between therapy sessions. Um, the therapy sessions are delivered again by the multidisciplinary team and they are intended to mostly monitor progress if there's been any, but also to make adjustments because again, this is a, a tailored program of activities. Um, there's a link that I've put down here uh, about PRAISED if you want to get more info about the study. And we're running um, a multi-site RCT in which we are evaluating both the clinical and cost effectiveness of PRAISED. And again, there's a link here. This is the trial um, protocol paper. It's freely available online to get, again, more background info. So in terms of the COVID-19, when in March 2020, um, the UK government implemented measures to slow spread of COVID-19, this had an impact on um, PRAISED, of course. Um, in the first in instance, the lockdown started roughly from end of March and ended in, in August 2020, at least for the vulnerable, most vulnerable people. Um, in this case, people over 70 um, and with pre-existing conditions, dementia is, is part of this group, were required to minimize contact with others, to, to shield, to stay at home and only get urgent health or social care visits. Um, Embraced was not deemed... Um, uh, um, among these categories. So um, we had no other choice but to accept that our therapists could not visit the participants at home anymore for the therapy visits. And we um, immediately converted the visits from uh, in-home visits to uh, remote uh, therapy sessions. Um, so all the participants that at the time of the lockdown, the first lockdown in, in, in the UK, were involved in praise, they were immediately converted to a tele-rehab. Tele-rehab essentially was either through the phone for most participants and in some cases through video calling. And video calling is actually the core of my presentation today because that's the, the interesting um, and novelty bit. So one of the five research sites within TEAM um, is um, the Lincolnshire um, team. Um, NHS trust team. Um, this uh, specific research site team was able to deliver um, praise entirely, almost entirely, through a video calling platform um, named QHealth. Um, QHealth is NHS approved and it's a platform that allowed um, the multidisciplinary therapists and the participants to set up and, held, um, and hold the uh, therapy sessions online through a video conferencing system. Essentially, that's what it is. On the right-hand side, you can see a screenshot of the uh, interface of QHealth. So that's the main page where the participants would go onto. They would be provided with a password, a secure one, and they would uh, both um, um, arrange 
the um, therapy session, but also attend therapy session. So it's all through here. QHealth had two main requirements. One, of course, was access to technology, which as lots of the speakers today have, have already said is an issue. Um, uh, so um, basic stuff like an internet connection and a technology device uh, could be a laptop, computer, tablet, any, any kind of digital device. And the second requirement, quite importantly, was being able to download a Q Health application because that was the way in which they could book the appointment and, of course, have the therapy session. Um, so we ran uh, these, um, um, these um, case study um, um, based on the Lincolnshire team experience. The aim of this small study was to gather initial, and I say initial because again, it's a small study, so it's preliminary evidence on telerehabilitation for people living with dementia during COVID-19, maybe to derive some implications as well. The objectives were to identify those participants that Q Health worked for, how it worked and under which specific conditions, because as everybody said before, you know, every person is different. So the experience of dementia and also tech savviness is so different. Um, and the second objective was to also identify some of the benefits and more, most importantly, the challenges of uh, this system. Um, so we uh, did a qualitative baseline and follow-up case study. We selected all participants receiving praise through uh, Q Health during lockdown. We also involved their caregivers to get perspectives and also all the therapists from the Lincolnshire Lincolnshire Trust. Um, in terms of data collection, we uh, opted for semi-structured interviews um, that I did myself through conference calling and at two time points. So the first was one month into um, the into starting using Q Health, and the second one was four months after starting using Q Health to get also a sense of progress, whether you know the usability and and the the, the um, and, and the way that the participants interacted with the therapist changed over time. Um, we analyzed data through deductive thematic analysis because we had clear um, um, objectives as the main themes. So we, we set study objectives um, as the main themes of the analysis. This paper, if, if you're interested in, 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 in reading um, um, about it, um, it's on, uh, in open access online. Uh, so the title is down below. Um, and, and, and feel free to, to get familiarized with it. But in a nutshell, I'm gonna give you some, some, some of the results and findings we had from this experience. So in terms of, of, of who um, Q Health worked best and in, under which conditions, we found that almost a requirement was for participants to have somebody, um, carer, family member, uh, um, any person really, who could act as a facilitator during the process. So this was in terms of, again, downloading the app, making the connection, sometimes also trying to facilitate communication during the session. So for example, we found that for some exercises, it was good to have a carer, sort of almost translating the instructions from the therapist to the participant. So this was quite key. Um, we also found that a, a, a condition was for the therapists to show both enthusiasm about the new technology and also knowledge. We had some um, therapists who were less experienced and that had repercussions on the motivation of the participant to engage in, in this technology. Um, and also in, in terms of motivation, it was quite important to have, if possible, a pre-existing good rapport between the participant and the therapist. We found that where that was possible, because remember, some of these participants were initially face-to-face -face and then they were converted. Where the face-to-face -face had happened before, that had good um, um, re repercussions on the uh, benefits of, uh, and also um, engagement in this process. Some of the benefits of Q Health, of course, the uh, sessions were time efficient. So in terms of services, this was a um, uh, um, lots of money saving and also uh, travel time. So that's something to be considered. Um, somehow we found that when the participant was able to 
see the therapist through the video, their motivation um, to do the exercises was enhanced, in, in particular comparing to those who only received su support through the phone, so in other services. That, that was a big difference there. Um, we also found that because the caregivers were more involved in the process, um, somehow these kind of boosted their awareness about dementia and, and the issues that come with dementia, but also uh, boosted their knowledge um, about um, um, the condition somehow, because they were part of that process. Um, and, and also um, a benefit was that, that this um, QHealth really boosted the therapist's creativity to come up with ways in which to, uh, to, to get the full commitment of the participant and the carer. So to think about new ways to actually um, um, do rehabilitation. Of course, we identified some challenges. The, the biggest one was, um, as I was suggesting before, the users' uh, poor IT skills. Uh, sometimes it was generational thing. Um, of course, in most cases, it was a cognitive impairment issue. Um, so this is really um, something that needs stressing, but I'll discuss about this in the implications. Um, also, there was we found that there was little infrastructure and support for some users. So for example, it, poor internet connection, um, living alone was a big thing because nobody was there to support them in the process. So this again was a big challenge. And, and also from the, the therapist uh, side of things, they suggested that some activities were very difficult to undertake uh, and when it was not face-to-face. -face. Uh, risk assessment, for example, a progression of participant was very difficult because they were not there to assess and to progress them. There was a risk, of course, um, in not being present, but also ter terminating report at the end of the one year involvement was difficult because sometimes um, on a face to face basis it is much more almost of a human connection. So that was a bit of an issue. So just to sum up, um, this small study, again, it was just preliminary evidence, but I, we found it, in, it interesting because um, overall, we found that the clients, our participants, were very keen to learn. They wanted to learn, they wanted to, to try and use technology. They were not resistant. Um, and the therapists as well, they took on the challenge and they really tried their best. There was a major barrier, however, which was the lack of digital literacy um, and access uh, for clients. Um, so obviously there is a great need for service design for guidance, for delivery of um, services that are equitable for different people uh, with dementia. Uh, for people with dementia who are at risk of, again, being disempowered by um, technology as opposed to getting the benefits of, of it. But also we found that sometimes there was an issue um, with the services as well. Lincolnshire was the only service that managed to to really uh, realize this kind of uh, um, translation with, with a video conferencing uh, modality, but other services were not able because they were not ready, because there was less training, because maybe sometimes there was a bit of a resistance. So in terms of services, um, there's also some work in, in developing maybe a culture as well sometimes for this type of technology. Um, travel, traveling long distances, and traveling for a long time, sometimes um, where there are large catchment areas. For example, Lincolnshire is a very rural um, county. So um, a face-to-face um, um, -face rehabilitation is sometimes more time and resource intensive than tele-rehabilitation. So we would like to, again, um, underline that this could be um, an energy, um, um, a resource, a resource saving kind of approach. But our participants and the therapists as well strongly agreed that face to face is still preferable, are still preferable. Um, particularly when it comes to, um, to um, some 
um, uh, stages of rehabilitation, including the initial assessment, for example, progression, as I mentioned before, but also when you need to establish, build report and finish um, uh, report at the end of the involvement. So overall, um, it seems that this study suggests that video consultation are acceptable when social distancing is required, whether it's COVID or whether it's other situations where, again, the, the client cannot be cannot uh, maybe uh, travel um, for um, rehabilitation or um, in any instance where there is a need, then video consultations seems to be acceptable and doable. But a hybrid approach probably would strike a better balance between both the patients and service needs. So I guess that's the take home message that we derived from our little experiment. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, thank you everybody for your attention. I will unshare uh, if I manage. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Sal, you've got a question, you've got a raised hand. That was applause. Uh, oh, it God. wasn't a raised hand, but simply appreciation. <laughs> yes, let's give, give Claudio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I, in, 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 um, because of time, I'd like to limit uh, the numbers of questions now, again, as we did with Lucy in the talks before, keep them on your sheet for the sandpits. If you want to ask them, you know, if you don't want to attend the sandpits, put them in the chat. Uh, I think it was a great talk, uh, Claudio, and again, sort of highlights this need for a personalized approach, hybrid approaches, really um, looking at these difficulties in people living by themselves without mm. the support, with the cognitive impairment, with the challenging behaviors, perhaps people who, who don't really see the benefits of it, the people who perhaps need it most. W would you agree? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Thing? And one thing you mentioned before is very crucial. Uh, crucial. I think it's about motivation, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of rehabilitation and physical, <laughs> physical activity, when you have people with dementia who <laughs> have apathy, there is a need for support to mm. motivate them to engage in the process. And we found, unfortunately, that especially through the phone, that motivation couldn't be developed. I mean, it was a peculiar situation anyway, because COVID brought everybody down in terms of you know being active, but it was so difficult not seeing the therapist in front of you, yeah. having a chat, having somebody who's there for you and shows mm -hmm. that he has an interest in helping you out. In, so in terms of motivation, I think that there's a strong uh, need for us to keep this in mind and come up with ways in which in which we can work this out. Certainly the video helped in some respects because you could see the person, yeah. but still, again, the face-to-face -face probably is the way to go unless we come up with really equitable ways of mm -hmm. being able to work with this population. Yeah, perhaps, I mean, there are new ways on, on Teams, aren't there now, where you can you can work with people sort of with screens in a slightly better way. I mean, certainly better than light we have here yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in this room. But uh, no, that was great. It, it very much also tied in with, with things we heard earlier from, from physical activity for people with dementia is that the, the person doing the exercises, the actual trainer is really important. And you mentioned that previous report that the therapist needs to have uh, preferably to, to make it a success, right? So it's, it's important yeah. to have that connection rather than to perhaps just see somebody on the screen. Yeah, and also quite interestingly, if um, some of the participants said that although the, the, the therapist was not at home, still seeing them, uh, through the video, doing the exercises in, in uh, live with them, kind of kept that connection to an acceptable level, right. because right. it felt like, you know, you were still somehow connected to the person, you were together making an effort to do exercise. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, we're a little bit over time. And I've just been uh, texting with Martin. He has to, uh, he's got another appointment at four o'clock. I think some people might be bursting at the seams here and needing to go for a, a five minute comfort break. 
In the meantime, um, I can perhaps load the talk from Martin up. So we're ready to go. So let's take five, no more than five, and then uh, come back here at, um, at uh, latest, um, it's 15.30 now, it's 15.18. Uh, to, to start again, if, if, if you need to have a quick break or a quick drink or have some lunch in the back, there's still lunch to be had uh, if, you, if you would like it. Um, Felicity, did, did Martin send his talk? Have you got it loaded up? Well, lots of ideas, right, Saul? Um, uh, if I can... Hi. I've got my talk up as well. You oh, you've got your talk, so you can share. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Share, yeah. That's super. Oh, okay, great. Felicity, don't worry. Martin has got his talk, so he can he can just share it. Um, so uh, it's great that you're you're willing to talk, Martin. I'm really sorry we're we're running a bit late. No, that's fine. Um, I some of the discussions I just didn't really want to cut short because they they were really very good. Ooh. Very impressive. I'm just going to take a break and then we'll start at, at the latest at 18 past Martin. And that that would hopefully give you give you enough time. Yep, Thanks. I'll, I'll wing it, whatever it is. I'll I'll um yeah, I'll do uh, um okay. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Super. Thank you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
So um, we'll get back uh, on program. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, and um, now speaking, uh, the second keynote, I'm really pleased uh, that he has found the time to join us, is Professor Martin Oral. He is the director of the Institute of Mental Health and is involved in many um, advisory groups of government. He is on the committee for Interdem and um, uh, is involved in advising memory clinics. He's obtained many millions for his uh, project and has written many very important papers. And today he will be talking about uh, the use of uh, technology uh, for people with dementia. <coughs> Martin, would you like to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eve. Yes, thanks for that introduction. And uh, it's very nice to be here. And um, thank you for the very kind welcome. So I'm going to talk about our interdisciplinary network for dementia using current technology. This is actually a grant by the uh, EU, a Marie Curie network grant for um, PhDs across Europe. And it's linked with Interdem and various other um, major organizations that you will see uh, along the bottom with too many to, to note. Um, we're also, um, going to talk about the best practice guidance for human interaction with, with dementia, technology and dementia today, and that's been uh, that's been developed led by Professor Rosemary Droz, who's um, one of the um, one of the leads in our Induct program. So, um, so the objectives of Induct um, it's to develop an intersectorial educational framework for technology and care for people with dementia and to show how technology can improve the lives of people with dementia. And so one of the key things is actually to develop this multidisciplinary uh, training program across Europe and to provide a comprehensive PhD training for early stage researchers uh, on uh, dementia and the needs and giving them the right skills to work in academia, industry or the health and social sector. So some of the objectives are to look at the practical, cognitive and social factors to make technology more usable for people with dementia, to look at the effectiveness of, of current technology and look at barriers and facilitators for implementation of technology dementia care and to see how we can disseminate it. Now, this is a very nice uh, diagram described by Rosemary Droz. And when we developed the proposal for Induct, one of the key things was actually that um, there was a lot of technology out there. Um, sometimes it hadn't been designed with people with dementia. Uh, sometimes 
It was being marketed without having been fully tested. And uh, there was a, a constant appetite for more and different types of technology. And we wanted to look at what technology was available and to actually do individual projects on those um, and to create some practical research to help technology um, be better geared towards people with dementia. So you can see we've got the, the three domains there and there's the um, four early stage researchers in the first one, then there's um, six in the second and five in the third. And the cross cutting themes are looking at um, practical cognitive and social factors, looking at effectiveness and looking at implementation. So, um, and one of our goals was developing the consensus guidelines. So you can see how the training program worked. We had a mixture of the network wide and the local doctoral training. We involved people with dementia um, with, through the European uh, Working Group for People with Dementia. There's work on enterprise, on policy, implementation and dissemination. So you can see it's not your average training program for PhDs. And as you can see down the bottom, there's a a great diversity of skill sets that people get. But so we weren't just training people in research, but we're training them in the broader skills around policy, entrepreneurship, PPI, and implementation. Now, the idea is the whole idea behind a lot of Europeans research, pro research programs is to is for the betterment of people in Europe and for um, adding to the prosperity of Europe as a whole. So it's good, uh, important goals. So the idea is that it, was a, it wasn't just 15 pieces of research, but it was training to create um, researchers who could have a range of skills and be um, a hireable in a range of fields, including technology, uh, academia, public health, um, and to have a broad knowledge base and so in a sense, it's actually providing uh, people that Europe wants to hire. And um, so that will help prepare them for senior academic positions, but also help them for understanding issues around uh, the industry, around um, the Alzheimer's society and the Alzheimer's Europe, and uh, getting good understanding of the commercial as well as the technical requirements. So, as part of our collaborations, we actually linked with um, the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Disease International. One of our students did a, did, a, did a secondment in Indonesia. That was Harleen Rai, who worked with me, um, under Alzheimer's Disease International. We worked closely with Alzheimer's Europe and the European Working Group for People with Dementia. We also had, uh, um, as partners, the World Health Organization, and the World Federation for, uh, of OT, but also we had uh, three small and medium enterprises, which were uh, technology companies, which were working with us directly, where people did secondments, and then MindTech, which is a, a, a kind of technology uh, escalator, if you like, again, based at the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham, which has you know, remarkable connections with industry, but it, it, it serves as a real interface for linking up uh, technology with researchers. So these are our 15, uh, 15 uh, researchers we had. And um, so we're looking at technology to support everyday life. In taking our training, the training um, all the way along. Uh, I've got I've got somebody saying, "Is everyone else losing yeah. Martin?" Sorry, um, Martin, um, we, we so lost it. Um, let's just. Uh, it doesn't seem to be right. uh, anything well, on this. The, um, I'm going to leave my um, back any second, yeah. 
it's well back. i tried clicking on a link and um it obviously didn't come up on my um on my ipad but there we go um so that's the you can have a look at the dementia link i could see it on my my other computer here um and so we're looking at the main objectives looking at practical cognitive social factors effectiveness and facilities. So is the individual projects we had one dimension like um, I see the screen hold a second just give it okay turning somebody's advised me to turn my graph I'll try that I think it's since I went to the um okay yeah uh, maybe maybe if you turn your camera okay. off, Mark. I've done that, some... yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I've done that. Um, so these are the 15 induct um, yes. projects, empowerment and surveillance for people with dementia. So this, for example, is looking at monitoring systems for people with dementia and the stigma and the human rights issues. And they found that the monitoring systems were, the same systems were marketed for um prisoners and for animals as well. So they're saying, well, can you just use these for all sorts of, uh, of groups? But actually, um, there's a lot of human rights issues in relation to surveillance that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, brain training is an exclusionary process for people with dementia. In the fact that they have, you know, could have difficulty accessing these kind of things and actually it it's, uh, can be stigmatizing for them. Um, looking at access to everyday technology, people in Europe and internationally. Um, developing uh, cognitive stimulation therapy for a tablet system. We've got that now called Thinkability. Looking at how computer technology can enable um, participation for people with dementia in care homes um, and using arts and crafts type of technology, exogaming. Um, using using uh, tablet technology for health promotion and social inclusion, um, using e-monitoring to help uh, monitor people's uh, people's uh, well-being, um, and then other work on palliative care and advanced care planning, um, piloting of the I support program for family carers, which is WHO program, and Gradio, which is a Spanish. Um, a, a, a Spanish uh, cognitive rehabilitation program for people with dementia. So it seems to be taking a few seconds between going on to different programs now. Um, just give me a, uh, hang on a second, okay. Okay, so it's, it's just taking a few seconds to go across. So these are the early stage researchers and their um, and their supervisors, and now these are the um, the best practice guidelines. So we got all the fifteen uh, in depth projects to produce recommendations. So we've got a summary of recommendations of improving the usability and effectiveness of technology, and we've got a, a website, an interactive website, which can be um, updated with new recommendations. And we've got a current European project called Distinct, which is another 15 uh, PhD projects uh, on technology and dementia care, and particularly looking at social health. And we want to look at the us usability and effectiveness in the future. So, um, so this is the uh, guidance. If you want to go to the website, Actually, was going to do that now, but I disconnected last time, um, and you can see. And um, so, the best practice guidance have now published, and they're available as a PDF, but also as an interactive website linked to our uh, dementia induct website. And you can see the recommendations are in the three groups around practical, cognitive, pra practical, and cognitive and social effectiveness and also um, implementation facilitators and barriers. 
So there's two formats to that. And uh, those are the particular areas for where you can start to search with the recommendations. And you can go on to uh, select which target group you want. So whether you're looking from the point of view of user of technology, developer, researcher, care provider, uh, policy makers, or the media, that's very hands-on. And then the recommendations there can link with that. And so you can see each of the recommendations um, uh, are organized into, into the groups around um, different areas. First one around usability, and you see how that breaks down into the three themes, everyday life, meaningful activities, and healthcare technology. And so here's one of the recommendations. So this is about um, technologies being very important, but there's uh, problems with the increasing complexity and how people rely on them at home, in um, traffic situations, or healthcare services, and the usability to manage products and services has often been neglected. So people with dementia often don't use technology because it doesn't match their needs and capabilities. Um, so this is about surveillance technology. So it says providers and marketeers of surveillance technology shouldn't communicate with a wanderer with dementia discourse. They should focus on user person-centered products and use this in a non-stigmatizing way because it's not just aimed at the family care, it's actually the people with dementia who, um, you know, who it matters for, because they're the people being independence. Martin, I, I think some people are having issues in um, in hearing it. Um, not sure what we can do. It's already uh, Steve and I. So it's on there. Um, she has some wonderful work on this. You can see she's already um, published a lot of uh, papers. Martin, we, we can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that I could hear. <laughs> okay, so, um, yes, uh, so so you can see there's quite a few uh, papers published by Yvette Vermeer, and if you want to go to the website, you can look up some of the, um, the different um, papers in relation to technology. And um, so, one of the recommendations here is consider using occupational therapists to enable people with dementia to use everyday technology. We've been very lucky really, because we've had um, uh, a wide variety of uh, 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 interdisciplinary backgrounds. So we've had quite a number of OTs, and this is a perfect, these are perfect projects for OTs to do because of their, their very um, problem, -oriented, problem solving uh, background. So this is um, looking at usage of technology, and this really shows that um, how much people with dementia, sorry, how people with dementia are less likely um, to use a whole range of technologies than people without cognitive impairment. So they mapped everyday cognitive technologies um, up to 31 different types um, for people with dementia and people without cognitive impairment. And they looked at what people are actually using. So we see that technology itself can be empowering, but it's also disempowering because uh, people can't use it or they've not been given the right kind of uh, coaching and support to use it. Um, so here we're looking at uh, meaningful activities and um, so different types of uh, technology. You can use tablets for meaningful activities. Um, you can look at how this is uh, um, how this is evaluated. I won't put the video on now because uh, 
might lead to some problems, but um, this is about um, different ways you can, you can solve things before you're testing the effectiveness. And we know that actually the practical issues around the effectiveness are very crucial. And there's, um, there's also other work done by Franz Verheer and his team looking at um, everyday fluctuations in things like mood and behaviors and cognition in people with mild cognitive impairment or care or carers to better understand the variations. And so this is a short video on, um, on understanding um, minor changes in everyday or small fluctuations in everyday, um, everyday mood and cognition. And it, here is one of the issues around um, extra gaming. So this is to do with, um, says technology is, is implementation is not just about effectiveness, but also on facilitating um, uh, factors that are impeding things, which can include privacy and autonomy and obtrusiveness. And there's obviously issues around stigma and, pers and personability and affordability. So this is about being able to get day centers to implement extra gaming. And so one of the things is they say, well, actually you need more than one person who's on board and trained in the, in the materials and the technology to use it. Because if there's only one person, anytime that person leaves or goes to another job, um, you know, that the activities are forgotten. I'm sure this is not just for extra gaming, but this is for lots of technology related uh, activities. It's a very logical, common sense finding, but actually it's just very useful to think, well, actually, um, if you're gonna try and implement technology, don't just try it with one person, make sure you get one or a few people on board. Um, so you can see we had um, 56 recommendations overall, looking at uh, everyday life, uh, meaningful activities, uh, healthcare technology, and uh, they were separated over the three different areas. Um, so, Here's some summary, then some new recommendations. Uh, taking a multi-perspective approach when, when getting public space technologies to improve uh, usability. One of the things is that when some initial work was done in, um, in uh, supermarkets, they found that the layout of supermarkets wasn't designed to be harmonious for people with dementia. It was actually designed to sell more products. So there might be things like uh, mirrors reflecting the fruit and the vegetables. And actually that could be perhaps confusing if people are seeing everything again in a mirror. Um, so the importance of OT assessment to help identify people's needs. Um, think about the benefits for family carers when people with dementia use technology. And of course there are things like thinkability where the person with dementia, um, but also the family carer can use technology together. Um, again, a very common sense thing, but ensure the technology is compatible with a range of relevant platforms to promote implementation. Um, what we found is that uh, developers sometimes would only um, develop a piece of technology um, with the most modern version of, say, the iPad or Google um, uh, Plus uh, te um, technology. And actually, so that meant that uh, perhaps older people who had slightly older versions wouldn't be able to use it. So this is very important when new technology is being developed, it needs to be, have a range of, a range of, um, of uh, compatibilities. And also having a distinct selection of roles and responsibilities for staff when implementing technologies in say care homes. Um, one of our pieces of work was uh, by uh, Alini and uh, Barroso, and she was looking at the use of, um, of iPads in care homes and um, to use arts and crafts technology. It was very popular and um, you know, an interesting piece of innovation. So the hope, what we're hoping for for these best practice guidelines is they're relevant, their knowledge and recommendations for further development. There's clinical relevance, so we can look at usability and implementation. And we hope that they um, contribute to the availability of user-friendly, useful and easily implementable technology uh, for people with um, dementia and their carers and a more dementia-friendly society. So um, 
we're implementing the guidelines through um, the INDUCT, uh, the National Alzheimer's Associations, Alzheimer Europe, publications in uh, scientific and professional journals, discussing them with stakeholders at conferences, and um, we want to make use of it as well. And I'll thank Rosary Dose, who did most of the slides um, for this. And uh, before I finish, I'll just mention Interdem, because Interdem's a European Association for um, Research in Dementia Care, and it's a network across Europe. I think about 20 countries are involved. And if you're an established researcher with a PhD in publications, you can become a member of Interdem. But we also have a really active um, Interdem Academy where, um, uh, where we have an active Interdem Academy where we um, provide opportunities and training sessions for um, PhD students and early stage researchers. Uh, that includes traveling fellowships, uh, workshops, and a variety of other um, opportunities for um, presentations uh, linking with Alzheimer's Europe. So do think of joining the Interdem Academy, um, think of joining Interdem, and uh, we'd, we'd be very pleased to have people make inquiries. You can always write to me if you want to, and um, or look at the Interdem website. So um, the best practice, finally, the best practice guidance um, sets the scene for the new uh, grant that we've got, which is running into 2023, um, looking at the impact on social health. So what social health? People being able to fulfill your potential in society, self-management in daily life and social participations and meaningful activities. So part of social health is being able to fulfill your societal obligations. And the distinct recommendations will be rolled into the induct ones. So um, thank you very much for listening. There's the um, website link at the bottom. There's Rosemary Joe's address if you want to contact Rosemary about the guidelines. And uh, by all means, um, you know, feel free to contact me um, directly about the project or if you'd like about it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That was uh, a really interesting talk I'm, I'm i'm so sorry that we had to technological issues i think it was kind of illustrative of of some of the issues you mentioned and, and were mentioned before is that unless we have uh, a big team of people around us we were constantly comparing yes. here it's like where is it at and it's oh it's because he has his camera on or maybe not you know frantically trying yes. to get you back um but uh i think your your guidelines the developed guidelines will be really useful for our thinking about the next grants um you know really great to have that um one of the really interesting issues you came up with was the use of ot specialists and this is something that came up before almost um, am i right in thinking that this these are translators people who sort of translate the academic recommendation towards the patient well, in a more um, practical point of view it, it, it's a it's a variety of people i mean we've had um we've got some occupational therapists on the distinct program at the moment we've got one from uh singapore we've got one from uh, trinidad and tobago so we were able to recruit people from all over the world and this actually um, for occupational therapists, it gives them a really good chance to, um, to develop their academic skills in something that's really very relevant to their everyday work. Mm -hmm. So um, when, you, when you get an o OT as a researcher, I think it's, uh, you know, you, you get this added expertise. Um, yeah. And so they've done some really important projects about uh, the previous ones did work on how people can travel around London looking at the various technological obstacles, you know, including, mm -hmm. you know, using travel cards, uh, you know, understanding how all the gates and things work and how maps work these days. Um, so, but in practice, I suppose one of the things is um, there's, I think we're in, a, we're in a bit of a gap now because we're in a, in a situation where um, Older people are using much more technology than they were in the last mm. two years. I mean, there's been an incredible, I think, the leap in technology use by, by myself as well, um, you know, using Zoom now and doing everything online. 
So technology use has really accelerated, but for the people with dementia, you know, they'll, they'll be lagging behind, not just because the technology needs to be better, better geared up towards them, easier to use, more practical, but also because they've not used that they may not have used technology before they had dementia. That's right. So actually it's the, you know, the dementia's um, taken over before they've had the big technology leap forward. And so it's a bit, I mean, it's scary for me as well, but it can be a bit scary and, um, you know, disorientating for people because actually they, you know, they, um, they can be a bit left behind. And so we need to make bigger efforts with people with dementia to help them um, use technology, but create technology for them mm -hmm. that truly involves them in the design and the testing. Yeah, I think so. Two elements come back here, which is working very closely with people with dementia themselves, perhaps also using persona for the design. The other thing you mentioned was um, really interesting about who is going to help people. And if we're talking about staff, and this is something Tracy mentioned with MANCAP, is about training the staff. Now, one of the issues in social care, obviously, and, and, and healthcare in general, is the turnover, incredibly high turnover of staff and our inability to keep people on such low salaries with low job satisfaction, high workload in position. So something has got to be done that obviously perhaps at a policy level, you know, by increasing pay, obviously. But on the other hand, I think also the did you find anything in your research about increasing job satisfaction? For instance, the Tova Tafel, this Dutch mm -hmm. Uh, piece of equipment, you know, which is such fun um, people, well, staff and people with dementia. I don't know that we looked at that in particular, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I think that if we, if we look at um, Claudio's recent uh, work mm -hmm. on actually, uh, you know, linkage of partnership trust, that they really, they really kind of went for it. And I think there'd be a yeah. great deal of satisfaction from staff thinking, look, we managed to do it anyway. That's right. I mean, there is, we're, we're entering a kind of, um, we're going to be in a hybrid world in the future where some things are done online and some things are done in person. Mm. But I think one of the elements uh, that's important is actually getting, making that contact, having that bond with people initially to introduce them to technology, to go through it with them, to take the stigma out, out of it and yeah. to kind of boost their morale is, um, is really important. Um, and that's just harder to do online um, mm -hmm. because, it, you know, it's hard to get the, the human element, you know. Mm -hmm. But we need to find a way of training the trainer in an effective way. I agree, yeah, I, I think, agree. I think that seems to be a bit of the missing link. Is... 90% of what uh, Martin was talking about is extremely relevant to people with learning yes. disabilities as well. There, there mm -hmm. is a very, very strong correlation there. Mm -hmm. So we definitely have to be looking at what came out of these these best practice guidelines when we're thinking about proposals. This yeah. would be wonderful. Any other questions from uh, our audience here? We were joined by Professor Jim Horn, who came particularly for your talk, Martin. Oh, thank you. That's um, nice. <laughs> he's, uh, uh, he was, we unfortunately lost him to Leicester, but he was our sleep expert and now is looking at COVID and brain fog and perhaps the use of cognitive stimulation therapy, um, looking at promotion of sleep, physical activity, because he's obviously a sleep expert. So okay. Things he's looking at. Um, and any questions from, from the audience, Jim, for instance? Or Tracy? Tracy's got... Uh, somebody's, Scott Markham's got his hand up. Okay, sorry. Uh, Tra Tracy first, because I saw her first, and okay. then we'll have Scott. Um, I just wonder whether he, he look, he's looking at the... Um interrelationship between dementia and people with a learning disability with their um with the rates of dementia being higher in people with learning disability has that been considered in any of the studies have you looked have you included people with learning disability martin or was that an inclusion criteria um, for your eu program well i don't think um we did uh, specifically and I, I would imagine that a lot of the projects um probably didn't use include people with learning disability Partly because, um, you know, their recruitment, you know, their recruitment strategies. Yeah. It's not that. So, it may be that in some projects they were 
excluded, but it may also be that if you're looking around the regular memory service or the care home or things like that, actually you're looking in the wrong place to find people with um, a learned disability. There has been some work on CST with learned disability. Okay. Yeah. There's some, um, I think there's a paper by Afia Ali um, recently, you're looking at a pilot project on it. Great. Did, yeah. did it work? Um, I'd have to look it up, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm not, so sure really great, I'm not sure if it's a great program. Do yeah. you know it? No. So they have diff about, well, the program I know, they have different programs, but there's, for instance, 14 different activities you work through either with a group or with um, a relative. And you do different things, like you do, it ranges from ball games to oh, okay. arithmetic, where you say, well, you know, uh, you have five pounds, what could you buy for it? What could you buy for it when you were young? You know, so people have to do a bit of reminiscence, a bit of uh, uh, calculus. Um, I would imagine some of these are very, very good. I mean, some of them are crafts, for instance. And this is one of the few programs, the CSD, that really worked, sort of actually I, shown efficacy. I'm selling your program. I'm just, thank thing. you much. I'm just looking it up. Um, um, you can buy it for 16 pounds online. Uh, I need to have some money for this. I'm always selling your Thank program. You. So, but it is it is the only program that really, really works. Yeah. Perhaps maybe Clive Bollard. What do you think about his program? The WELL program works. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I was involved in that as well as one of the um, um, co-investigators. The um, There was a, a paper on learned disabilities and CST, which came out in Aging and Mental Health last year, okay. or um, came out actually this year in January. Um, and it was a feasibility study, and it looked that um, it, it showed that there was a high level of satisfaction and quality of life improved at 21 weeks. Oh, oh, but it was a small scale trial, and it was, I mean, hopefully the grounding for a larger scale study. So that's um, brilliant. That's the benefits of Google Scholar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott, I'm so sorry I overlooked you earlier. That's okay. Audience. Uh, so thanks, Martin. I've I've got quite a lot of questions. So I'm going to pick my top okay? four, but they're going to be quick. quite quick. So, how did you um, how did you measure the improvements to quality of life for the end user, the person with um, dementia? Or did I've you? Got quick, I've got a quick answer for that, which is we're talking about fifteen projects. So yeah. I think people used it, um, measured it in different ways. I've used a variety of things. I've used the DemQual. Previously, we've used the QualAD, which is pretty good and easy to do in um, the CST programs. We've also used the EQ5D, which is actually uh, not a bad measure. It's reasonably good in dementia, benefits that it's well understood. And also it has a, you can use um, uh, cost, you can look at cost effectiveness. Okay. Great. And there's a lot of similar themes to what you, the 15 projects you went to the, for what we're looking yeah. at in MENCAP at the moment. Um, okay. Is there a, a lessons, do's and don'ts with that sort of knowledge base that you were talking about online? So as well as the the uh, the advisory stuff, have you got a, a catalogue of don't do this in your project that you can share? Um, well, I think that's really embedded in the guidelines. So there I think you guidelines. Yeah. have a tour around the guidelines because the guidelines if there's something that you should do, it also tell you something about, about, you know, why you should do this in preference to, for example, on the surveillance work, it said, well, don't describe people as wanderers. You know, these are the, these people are the problem wanderers. It's actually, you've got to engage with people and work with them well. Thank you. Yeah. And is that going to be a maintained knowledge base? So August 2020 was the last time it was updated. Is that um, it's, it's being maintained because we've got another four year grant, which is nice. Okay, brilliant. So we'll and keep it I, going as long as we can. We've got no plans to terminate it at the moment. Um, and you can download a copy of their recommendations if you want, yeah. And probably the one that's more difficult, are you able to share any of the cost of any of the programs offline? Just if we were building rough order magnitude, certainly around the empowerment and surveillance and the use of and access to everyday technology. I don't know if there's a, well, a um, breakdown of spend and what you got for that spend well the way the um eu does these grants is different because what the eu does is it gives every phd student or esr it gives them a, a fixed salary 
based on what country they live in and they have some training and research costs to do with that so actually um you know you could divide our grant into 15 and say well this is the overall cost for people um and um so the the cost is it's not like a regular research project where you right. say okay we'll need a research assistant at this level you just put in and then the eu says okay well you, we pay you this much because each each um researcher gets this salary if you're in the czech republic you get different from in the netherlands say okay. and then there's this amount of money to go with it which is for training so they are generously funded yeah. um it's probably less meaningful for us the way you've just described it as well so yeah and it's so, so yeah uh it's okay. a phd student plus a bit extra yeah okay thanks very much martin thank you martin what about your indonesian phd did she do any work on cst there i know they're quite big uh, yes uh, um, actually as you know um uh they actually they've they've implemented cst yes, in indonesia yes, which right. they they apparently they i think you you may have told me that they're good at just taking things and things and saying, "Oh, we'll do that. We, you know, we can do this." And they do it immediately. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. And and there is a paper. I'm um, Harleen Rai with myself, and with um, Indonesian researchers. Yeah. Um, looking at um, what was needed to be done to adapt individual CST for people with dementia in Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this was a qualitative study, um, but it's published, which is nice. Yeah, no, they're very good in Indonesia, very quickly yeah, implementing yeah. Uh, whatever works, and it's rolled out nationally as well. Yeah, it's, it's um, brilliant. It's impressive. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and it was nice to collaborate on a paper with mm. them because... Yeah, um, yeah very you know, quick. We quick. all made a contribution, yeah. Mm. Oh, lovely. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for your flexibility, and sorry again for running late. I think lots of food for thought. I will definitely um, look at the guidelines. Sorry, there's something from Saul, Saul Albert. Um, uh, there's oh, the, we, we, it, how to involve people with dementia in our designs. Harleen and Rye and I published a paper including guidance on how to involve people with dementia um, in, uh, in developing technology. Okay. So it's worth looking at that. It was a review plus best practice guidance. Also, um, Claudio and I and other colleagues published a paper a few years ago on having people with dementia as peer researchers and what were the things to consider. So, um, uh, and the, the, in this, particular journal, do you remember the journal? Um, I think that was the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry was with Claudio. Um, the one with Harleen Rai, if you just put Rai, R-A-I and Oral in, you'll um yeah we published a few things together but that'll that'll come yeah. out quite easily yeah thank you um thank nice you to see so you much. all thank you very much thank um, you see you soon and thanks for the questions yeah um thank you bye, -bye for now thank, thank you. you bye 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 thanks um so our next speaker last speaker before the sand pits um is uh gisela race cruz is that you no who are you anyway um, i'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry you're the only person i didn't know Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, welcome. Sorry, that sounded a bit brutal. Uh, I just thought I'm, I'm dying to know who you are. And I thought, well, that's Gisela, obviously. Sorry, Gisela, you're clearly online. There you are. Okay, that's um, me. Hello. This is quite difficult, this dual tasking um, for me, obviously. Now, Gisela is going to talk about people with visual impairment and uh, using a competency-based approach, which is great. And I initially thought, oh no, Gisela should talk in January. But Gisela mm. is a wonderful linkage to the talks we're having today and the talks we're having in January. So I'm hoping with your expertise, you'll definitely also join us in January and maybe talk a little bit about some other aspects as well. Uh, but uh, I'm dying to hear what you found because I think that's a wonderful ending of the talks. After this, we'll have breakout rooms. So, sorry, Gisela, just, just uh, one second of your time before people run off. So hopefully we'll have online breakout rooms. Where we're asking people in, in groups of four, uh, around four or five, to come together and discuss, you know, whatever notes you've made. So things where I've been scribbling lots and lots of stuff where I thought, oh, we have to think about this. 
don't be precious about it. It can be a brainstorm phase. We'll talk more about it in a second, but don't run off after this thing. Oh, these stupid sand pits, you know. Please stay with us and, and, and help us with your expertise. And hopefully, you know, you'll want to be enjoyed uh, joining into, into, into the projects that we're applying for, projects with MANCAP, projects with people with dementia, overall, perhaps EU projects, H2020, etc. So, um, Gisela, uh, Scott, have you still got your hand up or is that just a hand, a, a, a sort of a wandering hand that it's... It's a legacy hand which will be going legacy. down now. Great. Okie dokie. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Gisela, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, let me share my screen. Um... Okay. Can you... Are you I, able to share? I don't can know. I, can, can, can you see that? Uh, not yet. Mm. Not yet. Um, did you email the talk to any of the speakers? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, can I share just like the... Uh... You should be able... Um, Sal, did you... Uh, could you check if Gisela has presenter rights, please? Okay. I think I can only share like my my full screen not my... Uh, if you go to the bottom that little uh, green thing share screen there should hopefully yeah. uh, let me... okay oh i can do it cool brilliant so so perhaps can't do it uh, uh, uh. i don't think she has she got presenter right? subject, subject for every subject i thought he do we know why Gisela have you got it on your on your um on on uh, have you got your talk open yeah uh, so if you go to the bottom and you do share screen there's a green sort of thingy there you see yeah yeah but it's just it doesn't appear anything to share just uh have, I don't have know you got, if... have you got it uh okay okay I think it appears now can you see it there you are Yes. Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank no you. Worries. So, um, um, thank you, everyone. My name is Gisela. Um, I am a four-year PhD student at the University of Nottingham, and I am based in the Mixed Reality Lab, supervised by um, Joel Fisher and Stuart Reeves, who I think is in this meeting. Um, so today, I'm going to give an overview of some of the work that I've been doing during my PhD which I am currently writing up, but uh, I will present only um, a workshop approach that I think might be relevant to the conversations and discussions happening today. Um, okay, so uh, my work sits at the intersection between human computer interaction and accessibility research uh, and um, specifically focused on visual impairments, but uh, also a lot of the work that I'm drawing on in turn drones on for from disability studies and disability justice activism uh, and it is mainly concerned with uh, to what extent and how are people with disabilities included in the technology design process um, because there's people with disabilities who are regular or expert users of a variety of technologies both mainstream and assistive um, so on the one hand we have um, designers especially those of mainstream technologies that uh, do not really know about these users or how they do things. And on the other hand, we have um, specialist technologies that although they are well-intentioned, sometimes take a deficit model to design. Uh, that is that they focus on the impairment or on what's missing, trying to replace it or substitute it, um, or technology that oftentimes do not consider the social material uh, factors involved in using them. So these are roughly um, some of the areas that I try to address with my work. Um, and as I was saying, one of the main contributions of uh, my PhD is a workshop approach that I defined and implemented throughout my studies, which was focused on reflection. Uh, and the aim was to bring people together um, with and without disabilities, in my case, uh, visual impairments, from different technology backgrounds, um, so they were users, designers, developers, researchers, who also have um, varying degrees of knowledge in accessibility, 
some of them from their own lived experience and others um, from, from their work. And they were also people who didn't really know anything about accessibility, but they were interested in learning about it. Um, so I brought them all together to reflect on technology, accessibility, and disability. Um, and I conducted eight workshops. Um, they were all online because of COVID. And um, all of them had two or three participants just to aid the conversation. Um, and um, these two, this uh, workshop ha ha is comprised by two main uh, components. Um, one of them is a deck of cards that I designed and defined that contain the competencies and experiences of people with visual impairments. And the other is a very small catalog of video demonstrations of visually impaired people using technology. Um, and these two materials are heavily rooted in empirical work, um, of which I'm not going to talk a lot, but um, we have a paper on this in case you are interested. So um, just to say that this, this was an ethnographic study in which we investigated um, technology practices of participants. And through ethnomethodology, we focused on the interactional competencies of people. As I was saying, instead of focusing on the things that they cannot do or the issues that they encounter, we wanted to know how, how it was that they managed to uh, accomplish their activities regardless of their visual impairments or because of their visual impairment. Um, so uh, the first material was this, and I'm not going to go into much detail on this. Um, but I just want to show you that the, the, the deck of cards I designed, um, it has mainly uh, five categories of cards. And the first one is uh, competencies cards. Um, I guess that's what it was saying that it kind of fits a bit um, the session, the next session of acting um, because it focuses on what people can do, uh, not only on in, an individual level, but also on a social le level. Um, and the other uh, rest of cards are kind of add um, more layers of context, uh, like the tools they use, the activities they perform, the relations and the locations. Um, so this was um, the first material. And the second material, uh, as I said, it was a small catalog of demonstrations of technology. Uh, and this was because um, demonstrations were a pervasive phenomenon <laughs> captured during fieldwork. Um, I actually collected over a hundred of demonstrations and interest and interestingly, I didn't collect them on purpose. It was just something that naturally emerged, emerged in my, uh, in my fieldwork. Uh, so I have another paper, which is currently under um, minor revision. So hopefully it will be out soon or at some point. Um, but in that we analyzed in detail what are demonstrations, uh, how they are done, how they are being done and, and what we are learning through them. Um, and all in all, uh, I think we are arguing that demonstrations are effective in providing accounts of real world activities as they comprise um, much more than just sh showing technology functionality, of which I'm going to show you um, an example in a moment. Uh, but before that, I also want to add that through this work and also through, them, through the workshops, through using the, the, the demonstrations with participants, I came to realize, um, and I think this was um, probably mentioned before in some of um, the previous presentations, uh, that there is a strong demo culture in disabled communities. For my participants, for my group of users, uh, they are very used to demonstrate to their peers for, for learning and for teaching, and the same way they are used to see other people demonstrated to them. Um, and as well, they consume a lot of content um, of um, online demonstrations. Um, so for example, on YouTube or specific uh, websites that create, uh, produce and share um, these demonstrations. So there is definitely a really interesting and rich source of material that is readily available online that is um, worth looking. Um, so I'm going to show you um, an example of this. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I hope you can hear it. Uh, this is a completely blind person who um, is showing me 
how he uses an app, um, how he uses the camera of the app, um, the camera of the phone, sorry, for detecting light sources. Um, so we are just like in the kitchen of his house and he's showing me this and I hope uh, I hope you can hear it and, and see it properly. I'm looking for the light from where it's detecting. So that tells me there's a light source there. Also, if the fridge light is working, also if you turn the light on, okay. So the light is roughly there. And that helps me on a night time finding whether or not the lights have been left on. I don't know. So they use that quite uh, often. Okay, I think I read a comment that says that it sounded okay. Oh. So, uh, yeah, if. Um, Coming back to the competencies cards, um, just as an example, um, if I were to ask you to reflect on the um, competencies that I list here in my cards, um, what competencies do you observe in the video that I just played, then um, we could say that there was definitely some auditory and tactile levels because he was um, listening to the, to the app, to the sounds and recognizing a different pitch, a different meaning on it. Um, and there's also some element of tactile um, exploration on the reaching the fridge and, and opening the door and also a special awareness of the, of the kitchen space because um, he knew roughly where the window was and where the, the ceiling was, the, the light on ceiling and the fridge. And lastly, we can say that um, there's some sort of assistance and negotiation happening with me as an observer because he asked me to um, turn the light for him and then I kind of interrupted him at the end for um, telling him that the light was off. <laughs> um, so this is how we use the materials in the workshop. Um, and this is the rough structure of those sessions. Uh, first, I presented a small catalog, uh, as I said, of demos from which participants selected one or two clips to play and discuss. And then we use the cards to reflect on the videos played, um, uh, just the same way that I did in this presentation. Um, and lastly, we used only the cards to reflect on other experiences of visually impaired people. Um, so I also want to say that this structure was defined in consultation with uh, visually impaired people to make it accessible. Um, of course, providing them with uh, accessible formats uh, of the materials. Uh, but also, for example, for presenting the information in a specific way, uh, like the cards, uh, I introduced them category by category in a staggered way, instead of presenting them all at once. Uh, so just to make so just to make the whole workshop um, more accessible for them. Um, and just to briefly talk about the outcomes, um, I think one of the main findings of the workshops um, was that the materials helped unlocked participants' interactions and discussions. Um, so for example, the materials generated questions by non-disabled people, which were responded by visually impaired participants who kind of took the lead in explaining and solving doubts and kind of taking that um, teaching, teaching learning and learning role. Um, some workshops also uh, only have the visually impaired participants. Uh, I think I forgot to mention that I aim to have at least one visually impaired participants in, participant in each of the workshops. And there were some that only had visually impaired participants. So the conversations were geared towards requesting and giving advice of technology. Um, and also across all workshops, the materials helped the participants to notice things that maybe they didn't know about or never thought about before. Or conversely, uh, when they did know about these things, uh, people related to their own lived experience. So that was also interesting to see. Um, 
And I guess just to wrap up, I want to say that there's definitely a need for creating bridges or spaces in which disabled people have direct input and conversations about technology and in the design of technology, and that this could benefit from employing a competencies approach. Um, and lastly, just to say that I think that demonstrations are a very fruitful tool for both doing empirical research and also for prompting um, design ref reflections. And I think that that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, that was that was excellent. That was a really great talk. And what a lovely way to wrap up the talks that we've had. Thank you so much. Um, Sal has got a uh, has got a question here. He said, "You mentioned disability rights acti activism. What was the role of social movements in your work? Would you uh, would you be able to answer that, Giselle? Yeah, uh, I cannot see the the questions, but um, yeah, definitely. Like I was saying, um, I think what got me into that is because I uh, a lot of the work that I draw on. Um, that is very recent, actually, like five years in accessibility research in HCI. It's um, increasingly looking into um, into uh, getting involved not only the people, uh -huh. but all this history, all this history of disability rights and disability justice. So uh, definitely, that's why I think it kind of matches with my view of not wanting to fix an impairment or substitute an impairment actually accommodate people and, and include them in the process and, mm -hmm. and listening to their needs and their yeah. and their wants. Yeah. And I think that's something that's really come out of this day, hasn't it? Is is go from user-centered design is working with people, asking them what they need and how they want it. Because I think too much of the technology is developed by by people who have competency across all the levels but i loved your idea of looking at competencies in people who you know it needs to be much more of this what what are you able to do what can you do how can we work with you to enable you to participate and and be part of an inclusive society there was a question thanks for flagging that up so i didn't see it from magnus he said what was the background for the workshop design um um uh, what do you mean like background of the of the workshop that i employed yeah what's that yes. Magnus, are you talking about yeah, I'm, 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 I'm here i can i can ask the oh, question yeah, yeah, in yeah, the no, dark. No. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Suddenly the light just disappeared. I, it, That's how I, it happens. I promised that it was uh, much brighter when I sat down. Um, no, I was just, uh, I quite like the workshop design, but I was just thinking um, uh, what inspired it. I mean, I mean, did you just make it up or did you, uh, did you actually, well, steal from somewhere or did someone else do a <laughs> similar design or, or what, what happened? Yeah. So, I think it's definitely inspired by um, participatory design or co-design activities, but I, I think I wasn't really keen into doing design right away. And also there was the pandemic. So it was also, I, I think it just happened to be. <laughs> um, and because I had this material from my, for my empirical work demonstrations, I really wanted to do something with it. Um, so I just used it. So I kind of, I think I kind of just uh, took a bit of inspiration from many places, but but the whole structure was uh, I just I came up with it with my with my work. So yeah, wonderful. I yeah I really like that idea of empowering people by focusing on ability rather than this concept on what can you not do because that stigma on you know and and i loved your demo that was that was that's very empowering for people i think also for perhaps for other people with uh perceptual um disabilities to see how somebody navigates the space using this app that's very 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 good did, did you come across that did that did that come out of your when you when you were doing the demonstrations with people um, yeah, actually, they 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 show me what they normally use, what they they regularly use. So um, so they use this um, this app for detecting objects and for reading, especially mm -hmm. because it detects the, the text in it translated yeah. read it reads it aloud. 
and there's definitely this uh, technologies for navigating, but uh, and they exist, but the participants that I, I encounter in my study, they, they just don't feel safe using them for going around and about. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's interesting as well how they rely on other people more than on the technologies sometimes. Yeah, it's called, called seeing AI. Is it called seeing AI? Yeah, yeah, it's seeing AI. Oh, you, you know of it, Tracy. And Ahmed had a question as well. Yeah, it, uh, it is yeah. okay. So, so you, 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 that app of light, that that's seeing AI. Okay. And what about your cards? I mean, they look great. So, so you used them in the demo. You had these different abilities. So, how did people work with that? They said, "This is what I can do." So, you, you look, you, you gave people the cards. And then you said, is this something you can do? So you had a set of cards. These are my abilities. This is what I'm able to do. How, uh, how yeah, so, so the cards I defined from the first paper that I mentioned, mm -hmm. it was um, I, I used like ethno methodology to kind of uh, identify those from the, from the fieldwork material that I collected. And then I designed them. I, I, um, yeah, I created the cards. And I brought them to the to the workshop, and I, I showed it to the participants, and I I did say like reflect from this list of competencies, uh, what do you think it, it applies yeah. to you or not? Great, great, and that's already very empowering in its own uh, own right. So Stuart says the card approach has been done quite a bit mixed reality lab. It's a technique kicking around the lab, which seems useful. What what's a mixed reality? Oh, that's our our, re, uh, our research lab. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Mixed reality. I like that. Uh, yeah. So, often, so these... often suffer from it. Mixed reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is just an approach, like having a deck of cards for inspiring. Um, I think it's normally for inspiring brainstorming or evaluation. And right. I think, yeah, I focus them more on reflection, but I think they could definitely be used for doing more hands-on yeah. design yeah. see a lot of i think from what we've seen with the other talks a lot of it was very verbal and i think people i mean i know i myself work much better with visual i don't like huge amounts of text and i think that the especially the generation coming up likes visual bits, visual information. It's also cross-culturally much more applicable. And if you're working with people who have literacy issues or dyslexia, uh, ADHD, uh, or dementia for that matter, you know, you need to have something. And your cards work, work wonderfully, aren't they? They're very, very attractive. So I think it's a great tool uh, to work with. Thank you so much. I mean, you'd, I'd hope you'd be interested, you and your supervisors, in, in working with us. So we're now at a point, and, and please stay with us. Don't think, oh my goodness, you know, I can't stand this anymore. I want to just go and drink tea or go to loo. Do all of that, but then come back and then join your breakout group. So hopefully this is going to work. It's always a very exciting moment when we're trying to make the breakout groups work. Um, we're in the breakout groups. Let me just explain. Ahmed, you want to say something? No. Oh, yeah, you're also just stretching. I'm constantly getting confused by people doing the hair or stretching and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm missing out. Um, so we've got these forms. The forms are just guidelines, okay? So from the talks that you've seen, maybe you've got a particular talk, maybe you've got a particular take home message on who we should focus on when we're designing and how we should do that. How about using Gizla's cards or other, other means or ways? Then if we're, what, what should we be looking at? What's needed in that field right now? What do we hear if we're practitioners? What are we hearing from people in the field? What do people want? What do people need? That particular group you are interested in that might be learning disability for Tracy or people with other uh, abilities or disabilities. Uh, people with dementia, um, uh, uh, you know, people with visual impairments. What, what do we need to focus on? How are we going to do that? And then we've already, a lot of the talk has been about training the trainers, working with me. We can't just throw an app at people 
that's become clear and say, you go for it. You know, that, that's just not going to fly. So who is going to do this? Who will be a mediator? Can we work with volunteers? Can we work with carers? We've seen that in the carer dynamic, there's issues, aren't there? We've, we've heard that frustration. Uh, you get it involved into all sorts of dynamics, especially, and we, we've seen a lot with people with dementia where all of a sudden, uh, you know, you have a man and, and, and his wife, and all of a sudden these dynamics are completely disrupted with somebody who used to be empowered, perhaps uh, the female in the family or the male in the family, all of a sudden, because of that dementia journey, needs to take another position. And the irritation that that brings with it can then stop people from engaging with very meaningful activities. So we need to be aware of this when we're, when we're talking about, you know, who is going to do this? If somebody's embroiled in this dynamic, yeah, somebody's being killed outside, don't worry about it. Um, so if, if people are being embroiled in this, how can we, how can we somehow negate that should we be working i'm thinking with third parties volunteers who university of the third age or somebody else you know think about this who could that be ot's but who's then going to pay for it what about people who don't have access how can we come up with access to to this so what could we what could we do and then once we've got that what sort of activities are we looking at with what outcomes? So we, we've got an issue here. Say we want to improve independence, then how would we measure that? Is that a memory test? Have you got one? Is that a, a visual impairment test? You know, what, what, what are we looking at? A competency test, a resilience, a self-efficacy test? So what would you like to do? So these are the questions. Now, my, my suggestion is um, that, um, if you go out in your breakout groups, is to appoint a chair, this person who is bossy and uh, is willing to uh, say to people, can you please talk a bit, you know, tell me what you think about life and the universe and the questions just asked in particular. So try to get, try to appoint one person who will take the lead. I think that always works best. Then take turns to describe these these issues outlined on the paper these questions what who which where how who's going to pay for it etc um and what you could bring to the table so try to um try to talk in turn about this now if somebody don't as a chair don't be too prescriptive so somebody all of a sudden goes oh i've got that I, i've got that test allow that we're going to ask, so you've got um, until 20 past, uh, not quite until 20 past, let's allow, how much time did we say, Felicity, 20 minutes for the whole thing? Yeah, so about, about five minutes, five minutes per person as a chair and, and talk obviously as a chair yourself. And then to have at, at the end of this, to have the chairs, reporting back to us and obviously they can be helped if somebody thinks oh the chair really didn't didn't capture what i what i said please join in but uh for time uh, keeping purposes um half an hour okay so so 20 minutes to half an hour then we'll break it up um and um we'll we'll get back to the uh, because we have until half past, don't we? We've now got an hour, so twenty minutes to half an hour, and then if you would come back to us at five, right? At five o'clock, please come back to us. Join join with us if you're here in the audience. We'll break up in groups, and then uh, we'll spend the the other time, the other half an hour, however much you have time for to put this together and hopefully, so this is not for us to get your ideas and go, right then, thank you very much, but it's actually to invite you to join with us in, in research proposals and obviously with the RX2s and everything and the costing and what have you. So have that in the back of your mind as well. If you're thinking about joining in, what is that going to cost uh, to have you, you know, you might have a test or what have you. It, yes, love? Great. Yes. So actually, the slight change plans uh, for the breakout rooms. So we're just going to have a five minute break because we didn't have that five minute break earlier. Uh, 
we only had five minutes then. So I have five minutes. So uh, for you to have a comfort break, cup of tea, and then to go into your breakout rooms after that. So thank you very much. And I hope you're going to come back to us. If you can't, if you want to go home, um, please, you know, fill this in and send the form to us. If you want to write down and take a picture and email it to us, that's fine too. You don't have to go and fill it in notes or a short email to Sal and myself. That would be the, the acting group. That would be absolutely fantastic thinking about the things that we've just been talking about now obviously please join us also in january uh for the next meeting which is on 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 the impairments the sensory impairments the cognitive impairments um and uh the behavioral and psychiatric symptoms so uh, psychological symptoms associated with dementia in march uh the reminder of the date is on the back it's the 27th of january so senses, and that includes pain, um, maybe sleep as well, we're thinking about now that Jim is here. And the 31st of March, these uh, challenging symptoms. Yeah, please, I hope that you can join us then. Okay, we'll just go offline for a second to, to do your breakout rooms and uh, we'll see you back in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Ah, uh, Magnus, thank you so much. And I hope you join us in January, Magnus. And please, you know, if you have any comments, any suggestions, please do write them down. We really appreciate anybody's Definitely. comments, please. You know, any ideas you've got that are sparked by this. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Is that we're just going to... Well, I think a very... Good Sorry, I'm, I, I started recording again. Yeah, uh, no, no, I meant the question you asked to uh, Martin. You said, how how was yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I remember. I was interested how, mm -hmm. how Martin did it in his research. And in Mencap, we've got some approaches for how we measure quality of life as well. So mm -hmm. you know, we want to do some comparisons, but ours essentially fall down to, to three main categories where we look at um, the participation of an individual and how you can increase that, their own level of independence and uh, at their level of health and how you'd improve those three three areas and there's obviously a breakdown at cascade so um we've got ways of measuring quality of life which we're building on um but then we want to think about technology to greg's point how that really really plays a part over the next decade and so it's going to get greater and greater in terms of affecting those three areas um mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I won't. <laughs> we had our own conversation, which I'll put you on in a moment. Yeah, you, we'll you did in, in, <laughs> with Alison, I think. Was it Alison that was with you, right? In room three. Yeah, and Stuart. And with Stuart, uh, Stuart yeah. Reeves. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? And then we'll get back to uh, Greg. To You had your own conversation that you say, but what did that, what, what was that about? Happy to, but uh, or Greg can finish and then we'll. I don't mind yep. picking up after. Greg, uh, yeah. you want to tell us a little bit more about it? So really going on to a different point, and it's something that was a running theme throughout the, the whole afternoon is the importance of the supporter or the care or whatever the, right. the term of the person, their knowledge and their skills to be that enabler. So the enabling role seems key yeah. in a lot of this, and it's a key with us and um, it, it led to me scribbling some things down, which I might have to have discussions with about whether there may be a, a role within our organisation for, for people who are mm -hmm. technology enablers, if we're mm -hmm. maybe looking at this as a long term. We, we've had discussions uh, because I spoke a couple of times for University of the Third Age and are incredibly able people who want to want to do something with their skills and are really uh, IT literate um, and people, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if we could reach out to them to start a course, you know, train people who are interested because obviously because of their age, people, you know, there's, you, you need to have a continuation and volunteering is known to improve more well, massively, meaning. Train on the technology itself yeah. and understand how to yeah. really set it up, implement. And the other one is how to with that group. work with a particular group of people to ensure mm -hmm. that they can use it to the best advantage. Yeah, yeah. great idea. Oh. I, I like that a lot. We did talk about that in our group as well. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, the whole potential for volunteering. There's a new era of 
millennials and younger to yeah. instead of turning up to uh, provide support in a traditional way or take someone to the shops it's about coaching and using their skills very differently and that could extend to local community problems and actually getting people to come up with ideas and fixing them on loco technology which would then you know if it works would be built into something else and there's a whole whole future volunteering arm out there which um we need to start thinking about now mm. so i think the main bottleneck i could see here is linking it to the service users isn't it so and we have that whole thing about the ethics patient safety screening of these people uh, the other day, I, I asked if I could uh, clear out some trash and the council said, no, you'd have to do a full health and safety thing. And I said, I'm picking it up with my gloves right now. He said, yeah, no, if you're using our equipment, you'd have to be trained to pick up trash. OK, then I won't. You know, I'll do it with my own gloves, <laughs> like what the bazookas. But I could see the issues here being even worse because now we get people with dementia, learning disability, very vulnerable groups. Um, how are we going to make sure that not a bunch of weirdos sign up to go and do God knows what? Um, there, there's a big bottleneck there in, in, in society now with you know health safety and, and protection safeguarding. So I have to find a way around it. I, I don't know. Well, we have a volunteer program already. Um, you do? Yeah. So it sort of covers things like uh, DPS checking and yeah. stuff like that. So you'd you'd apply the same mm -hmm. ethical considerations mm -hmm. for, the, for any sort of anything that we need to do. I think you'd, but a little bit further on DBS, that's just people who haven't been caught yet, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I think you'd, you'd almost like to do a little bit of a questionnaire first to see where people are at with different scenario and, and how people would respond. I remember when I started working with people with dementia when I was 18, uh, the organization had various scenarios. For instance, somebody has urinated themselves you know what are you going to do and then to see what the response was which is quite good i think you know how do you actually engage we go through the same equipment same same yes, that we would with um, people who are great okay so you have that so we could use that uh yeah the, the dbs is mm -hmm. part of it but the, the um, interview process and yeah. the application process and Sometimes there's tests that go with it and meeting people and sort of seeing how they interact. Great. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's a bit difficult to do this sort of yeah. three-way. Um, I'm I'm mindful. So, Greg, did anything else come out of your group that you wanted to mention? I think really just the other thing is um following on from that is the difficult question of the ownership of the technology who purchases the technology when yeah. things go wrong with it whose responsibility yeah. is to repair and yeah and that it, it often ways this I suppose it comes down to whether somebody's purchased it themselves whether it's been uh been provided through assessment so mm -hmm. that's um, a, a difficult question as well and uh, i don't know if yeah. gizla there's anything else that you wanted to add no, pretty much that. Just I guess also the role of relationships and support system, but um, only that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I love I love your cards. That's definitely something that needs to be involved. I don't know how, what, but that's fantastic. Right. Um, let's go to group number three, who talked a little bit. Alison and Scott and Stuart. You already mentioned some of it. Were there other issues that, that were raised or possibilities or things to be investigated other than the importance of the carer's ownership? Um, yeah, so, so, we, we, um, so we, we talked about the, the, you know, what's happened in the, well, my position, what, what I think has happened in the last decade and there's lots of assistive technology and technology enabled support surfaced, I think, we linked to, to Alison's presentation earlier because we want to start thinking about how we close the feedback loop on this, that we start driving technology based on what the users need and not what's coming out and how we can just piggyback on it. 
um, we have a, a risk, a genuine risk, uh, men cap level, and this is for everyone in, in the UK with a learning disability, that if we don't think about how we integrate technology into their support plans, then we're failing them. So technology might provide a better level of support in terms of that quality of life than what a human can provide. And that's not taking away the human interaction, but it's just that they might be more independent and that allows them to do right. other things on their own or yeah. it improves their health or it improves the way in which they can participate in, in other things and go out and meet people and all the things we want to, to try and promote. So there's a risk if we don't get this right and think about how we integrate technology because that will only improve in the future. There's mm -hmm. also a risk for the social care sector and, and MENCAP not being immune to that, where um, the funding models will change in the future. Yeah. But yeah. we don't want the funding models to change just where local authorities and commissioners and clinicians can see savings in terms of money. We need to make sure we get the balance right, that it's genuinely driving it in the right way. So um, we, it's very easy to see a distinction where we reduce support hours because we've introduced technology and therefore independence that that case almost is easy to make that's quite a specific case where it gets much harder mm -hmm. and there's a hypothesis around that we think needs to explore around this is about how do we fund this um, yeah so yeah who pays of, that's right yeah, yeah. In, in terms of the pathway that we we think feels sensible at the moment we would like to focus on people with lower needs to start yeah. with where you could introduce you know, consumer led co consumer technology that's available it's fairly intuitive well defined already but would make a difference mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is because and again it was touched on in the earlier presentations um, that digital divide we tend to employ in the social care sector again men cap mm -hmm. not being immune to it people which cannot necessarily afford the technology in yeah. their own lives so how yeah. can we expect them to coach technology to people with a learning disability so mm -hmm. we've got a, a double thing going on here so we've already taken steps to try and increase digital capability and confidence for our support teams mm -hmm. but there's a lot to do in that space yeah. How do we then fund getting technology to people that can't afford it, which will make a yeah. real difference in their lives? And if we get that right, then mm. we can start to think about building on that, that triangle. So when you start to get into more complex mm -hmm. needs and you need more specialist technology, mm -hmm. you're not trying to jump in at that level. You've already built a foundation of confidence that people will then be able to support in the right way because that's mm -hmm. normally where it fails. So mm -hmm. we think there's a pathway here, but there are definite hypotheses around does it genuinely make can we get evidence that it provides a, a yeah. change of quality of life to the non-specialist mm -hmm. technology how do we enable the workforce to do that and give them the confidence and, and capability within their day mm -hmm. jobs and recruit the right people in and how do you fund some of that stuff mm -hmm. um, and, and we talked and Stuart, Stuart really um, brought it back to Gisella, Gisella's presentation area around where we are doing ethnographic methods and, and and those studies that exist out there to really understand needs of individuals within society and and mm -hmm. spoke that and think about um that level of fragmentation that exists out there at the moment if you can get to the, the nub of that that might help to start thinking about how you could prove this in a slightly different way so i think there's there's definitely some value in the in the thinking today around different research methods mm -hmm. that we haven't previously thought about, which might yeah. help us understand how yeah. we can take it forward. So uh, there's, yeah, there's I, loads I, of other I, stuff. I love that with, with, with Alison's topic. talk in, in, you know, providing different ways in, yeah. you know, which, yeah, you're absolutely right. And then I'd like to add with that, some of what came of our group where Tracy said, you know, this tension, which relates to what you were saying, Scott, from your group, the tension between the moment people with learning disability become more independent, that that changes the dynamic with the carer who then might feel they're no longer needed. So how do you mitigate that? How do you, how do you work with that? And, mm -hmm. and power dynamics in relations with people with dementia where you need to, if somebody is more tech savvy and more competent, do they then get the upper hand where they previously didn't have that in a relationship, which then increases frustration and a reduced adherence, etc. So these are all, I think, issues. It, it needs to have a very descriptive approach where you need to go into a situation like Alison Wood 
and see what actually happens here or like, uh, you know, Sal's group does, Felicity and Lawrence, you know, where, where you look at what is actually happening here within these dynamics and how can these particular people benefit from this? You know, what, what, what happens if we introduce something here? Is that going to upset that power balance or, you know, what, what's going to happen? Because what we've seen is that the support network, as you said before, the, the support network, if people aren't on, online with it or aren't able to use it themselves or are, uh, you know, uh, resistant, it's not going to happen, is it? Because they'll be trying to stop that if the network. And we did cut, and I'm, I know I'm hogging a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I just want to cover this as well. <laughs> so, but we did, we did also reflect on the user case historically has been too difficult for technology companies. So even yeah. technology companies that have started off with a user case being the individual, yeah. because there are so many different needs and it has to be quite bespoke, it reverses back to the care provider or the organisation mm -hmm. supporting, but then you're not really thinking about the individual and improving their quality mm -hmm. of life. So it becomes then back to a business case model rather than a mm -hmm. difference in society model. And that's yeah. a much harder thing to start. We need some evidence to prove that it's worth investing in that user case and taking the time. Yeah. To start to start breaking the cycle on this yeah okay up. that's that's really useful input uh we've had some of the discussions about some of the tests we're developing so dual tasking tests that the students are developing how people are engaging with that and capturing that qualitatively uh, we, uh, Lucy uh, talked about her blood flow and uh, cerebral plasticity to see if interventions actually work. So we're looking at not just quality of life, but also whether that independence is actually supported by, um, you know, changes in, in brain function. So that's more from a theoretical perspective. And uh, then uh, Augusta Augusti, uh, she uh, talked about the use of textiles and um, when Jim Horn was here he talked as a control about is it actually a thing this digital or does the human touch your actual interaction with your textiles a hug a person just sitting there with a cup of tea as a control provide more to that quality of life than looking at your app all day, you know? So that would be, an, I think that would be a, a, a different control, an active control. You can have a passive control with somebody's left to their devices and you can have the high appified digital uh, technological uh, activity that we're looking at to see how that, how that um, provokes change. I personally think that, you know, human, the, the milk of human kindness is far more of a contributor to well-being than any app, but that's maybe just me, you know, I, I, I'm not so sure. A hybrid. I mean, I'm with you with the story about the independence, which is something I hadn't thought about before, the need for empowerment and independence and the need to say, you know what, I don't need you right now. That was great this hug, but you can go home. It's fine. And I hadn't thought about that, which is really, really useful. Breakout room two. Uh, that was Nick and Stuart W and Samantha. Uh, are you still with us or... Uh, yeah. is Stuart Whitaker is still with yeah. us. Yes, yeah, Stuart. I think uh, Scott's cut uh, me because me and Nick both work from NCAP. Okay. Uh, perhaps a bit unfairly, we, we maybe hijacked the conversation. So it's a lot along the lines oh, of what, what Scott was saying, to be honest. I think the, yeah, there's two things really. I think Alison's presentation about the inequality, uh, and I know that's from an educational point of view, but the inequality gap, <laughs> that's the stuff that Scott's been describing that we're trying to address. One of the gaps. So there's, there's lots of people that could benefit, not least the people we support, families, staff, carers, commissioners, people who commission services. Um, we haven't got a lot of time left, but there, there's, a, there's, a big, there's a big bit about, for the people we support, they don't know what they don't know. And it's, um, it's up to us to try and make things simple for them. One of the things we're trying to do is trying to, we're trying to come up with a, with a simple little tool that, that works on somebody's outcomes. What are they trying to achieve? Ask some questions. So it really helps staff as well. So um, ask, ask some questions. The tool will filter down and it will give you some, some options for either software or tech that might be applicable mm -hmm. that we can then talk about um, who, who might fund it, who might, who might be able to get their hands on it, who could train mm -hmm. on it. 
Um, so it's, that's that's some of the stuff we're trying to do is try and get some simple stuff because there is tons of tech that already exists. Yeah. That people don't either have access to at the moment or just don't know how to use. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the other thing, probably about as far as we got to be honest, but there's um, people who commission the services are often as baffled as, as everybody else because there's so much out there now. And yeah. what, what we're not seeing at the moment really yet across the field is um, is at that commissioning stage, assistive tech really being considered. I think commissioners mm-hmm. often look to the providers to have to provide that solution. Mm-hmm. And um, so when, when funding and things like that are being agreed, it's not, it'd be, it'd be really helpful actually if, if assistive tech or the tech the person needs is, is, is up front at that point as being part of the assessment. Yeah. So there's a specialist yeah. involved mm-hmm. because some of the investment then might be, yeah. there might be an upfront cost, but the recurring cost. So some of that stuff you were just saying about independence, yeah. less support hours, yeah. maybe the member of staff at night, yeah. because you can press an alarm or you can call up somebody on a video call, you know, so there's huge, there's huge benefits, not only for that person in terms of their independence, but there is, there is a cost benefit there as well. Mm-hmm. Great point. I think, I mean, we talked in a previous grant application, we talked about setting up a website where users um, could like, like uh, give reviews of, of particular technology. And uh, we, were, we were going to do that actually with the University of Third Age, which we'll still do hopefully, but we didn't get funded for. I mean, we always do it anyway. So, you know, funding or not, we, we end up just being able to work with with wonderful students and and what have you but so we're going to set up this website um, with technology that worked and and was cost effective where you know a sort of one stop developed by users are they good that's good so who is already doing this fantastic um, yeah there's also a couple of apps called our sister asks sarah out there which yeah. like what technology mm-hmm. but if it, we also review that might be something you could well that's what we want because there's lots of overviews of there is this there is that but most of the stuff doesn't actually work or it falls apart and and that's what we need to have from service users to feedback where people say you know what this is great it's got all the whistles and bells but it can't work it that's from the Dis- disabled living foundation pro assist is it pro assist fantastic yeah, yeah. see one of the problems i think and that's been flagged up is there's so many initiatives mm-hmm. and a lot of this is funded work which is previously funded and it was developed and then it either you know, you, you don't know where to access it unless you meet somebody like you, Trace, who says it's already there. Or um, it. we were called up, we had an e- EU funding, we were called up by Leicester. We said, oh, it's just on the same project, but we, did, we didn't get anywhere. Do you want to use our staff to continue, you know, because five years is only that long. So ProAssist, it's called. ProAssist, the Disabled Living Foundation. Hmm. So this is something that could... Uh, uh, work for people with dementia as well. Now, the term disabled isn't very nice. I think if we're looking, it should be yeah, something like unable, isn't it? Processed. Uh, cool. uh, oh, it's for OTs. But you'd like to have something for people like myself, you know, looking for your mom. Yeah, who's... Ask Sarah. Ooh? Ask Sarah, same company. Our... Ask Sarah. Ask Sarah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah with an Z. With an S. Oh, Sarah. Ask Sarah. Okay. So these are users giving feedback on technology. These are sites where you can see what technology there is. Okay. If there was a way of you working with them to give feedback. Okay. Hey, so this is good. So this could be a UKRI grant where we're just doing an add on working with users and giving feedback and then somehow getting that into. Uh, oh, fantastic. Great. Thank you. Oh, see how good it was you came? Good Wonderful. Time. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. Lots of thinking. Uh, really fantastic. If if you don't mind, you know, if you want to, I've, I've made lots of notes, but if you want to send us ideas and clearly outline your name, um, you know, what you want to bring to the table, what you can provide. We can be thinking about, I can see different grants, okay? There could be grants for dementia, there could be grants for assistive technology, exercise programs, you know, we could, we've, we've got all year to develop something good, a couple of good things, preferably with a multidisciplinary take on it. And, uh, you know, and, and that also goes for the students, in particular, people like Gisela, people, the people here, 
police because you are the ones who have been reading about it so you 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 are actually more on the ball you can say well if that's been done or tracy can say it's already there you know that's what we need we don't want to be reinventing the wheel we want to be ahead of the curve and and sort of looking at what is needed now yeah great thank you all for participating and uh really really grateful please join us again uh for our next meeting if you want to give a talk and you've done anything particularly related to the distractions of relating to technology that could be physical cognitive we're looking at sensory in particular so people with visual impairments because visual impairment is something that happens very early in dementia we've noticed and it'll be really interesting to see can we change that can we how how does that affect you working with technology but of course if you have severe arthritis you also can't interact with with technology or if you have pain or if you are sleep deprived or cognitively disabled how can we mitigate that so that takes this one step further to go a little bit closer to the actual user to see how how we can aid the users and people like gazella you know will really need your input for that and and we've got several other experts here as well like tom will coxon has done lots of work and our some of our phds so thank you very much anybody who wants to speak please get in touch with the organizers and anybody who's got any brilliant ideas you know just send them to us please and we'll incorporate them and start thinking about how to outline this if you want to have ownership by the way if you are saying this is my baby that's okay too we're not wedded on driving this from us if you say well i'm better set up to run that from where i'm at awesome we'll work with you or you know you could do it by yourself you get you feel free to you know if you want to split off that's fine too okay so thank you all very much thank you i hope you enjoyed it i i came a lot with away with a lot too thank you very much okay. bye bye take care bye